Introduction of Medieval Hymns and Sequences This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal Introduction The hymnology of the Western Church may conveniently be divided into three principal eras. The first, which, borrowing a term from architecture, we may name the Romanesque period, extends to the conclusion of the pontificate of St. Gregory the Great, and is, as a general rule, distinguished by the absence of rhyme. Its principal writers are St. Hilary, St. Ambrose, Prudentius, Sedulius, St. Enodius, and St. Gregory. The second, or medieval period, commences before the termination of the first, with Venantius Fortunatus, and extends till the revival of classicalism under Leo X, with a feeble struggle for existence till the time of Urban VIII. Its characteristic is the adoption in its earlier period of single, and in its later of double, rhymes. The larger part of its writers have left no name. Of those that have, the greatest are Fortunatus, Venerable Bede, St. Theodolf, St. Peter Damien, St. Bernard, Hildebert, St. Thomas Aquinas, and, if we take sequences into the account, St. Notker, Godoscalcus, and last, but one of the most eminent, Adam of St. Victor. Thomas of Celano, if the Dies Irae be his, and Jacopone, if the author of the Stabat Mater, have each immortalized themselves by one poem. The third, or classical period, contains but one distinguished name, that of Santolius Victorinus. In the first of these periods, the church was unshackling herself from the fetters of meter. In the second, she was bringing out all the capabilities of rhyme. In the third, she submitted to the slavish bondage of a revived paganism. The following translations are entirely from the medieval period of hymnology and are made on the principle of always accurately representing the meter of the original. I had intended to prefix a brief popular essay on Western hymnology, but the subject is far too vast to be treated, even popularly, in the bounds of an introduction to so very small a volume. The reader must bear in mind that the uncouthness of many of the passages in the following pages is only a faithful copy of that of the original and must take into account the difficulty of grappling with the series of double rhymes which occur in the sequences of Adam of St. Victor and his contemporaries. Sackville College, Easter, 1851 Notice, several of the poems here translated will be found in Mr. Trench's Sacred Latin Poetry, a book which, whatever be the defects of its theology, can scarcely fail, by its learning and its good taste, to be useful. In one or two of the remarks on Adam of St. Victor, I am much indebted to Mr. Trench. But the larger part of my notes, notwithstanding their great occasional similarity to his, arising from the fact that both are taken from the same sources, were written before I was acquainted with his work, except by name. To him, however, I am entirely indebted for my knowledge of the poem of Bernard of Cluny. End of introduction. Section 1 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Pange Lingua Gloriosi. Venantius Fortunatus. About 580. Venantius Fortunatus, whose life extended from 530 to 609, is the connecting link between the poetry of Sedulius and Prudentius, and that of the Middle Ages. The friend of St. Gregory of Tours and St. Radigand, he long wandered over the south of France, the fashionable poet of his day. The latter half of his life, however, raised him to a higher post, and to a holier character. He died Bishop of Poitiers, the following is in the very first class of Latin hymns, and is retained, 
with a few ill-judged retouchings in the Roman breviary. Sing my tongue the glorious battle, with completed victory rife, and above the cross's trophy tell the triumph of the strife, how the world's Redeemer conquered by surrendering of his life. Footnote. The recension of Urban the Eighth here entirely spoils the original. Pance lingua gloriosi, prelium certaminis, by substituting the word lauream. It is not to the glory of the termination of our Lord's conflict with the devil that the poet would have us look, but to the glory of the struggle itself, as indeed he tells us at the conclusion of the verse. End of footnote. God his maker, sorely grieving that the firstborn Adam fell, when he ate the noxious apple, whose reward was death and hell, noted then this wood, the ruin of the ancient wood to quell. For the work of our salvation needs would have his order so, and the multiform deceivers art by art would overthrow, and from thence would bring the medicine, whence the venom of the foe. Wherefore, when the sacred fullness of the appointed time was come, this world's maker left his father, left his bright and heavenly home, and proceeded, God incarnate, from the virgin's holy womb. Weeps the infant in the manger that in Bethlehem's stable stands, and his limbs the virgin mother doth compose in swaddling bands. Meet lead us in linen folding of her God, the feet and hands. Thirty years among us dwelling, his appointed time fulfilled. Given for this he meets his passion, for that this he freely willed. On the cross the Lamb is lifted, on whose death our hope we build. He endured the shame and spitting, vinegar and nails and reed, as his blessed side is opened, water thence and blood proceed. Earth and sky and stars and ocean by that flood are cleansed indeed. Faithful cross, above all other, one and only noble tree, none in foliage, none in blossom, none in fruit compares with thee. Sweetest wood and sweetest iron, sweetest weight sustaining free. Bend thy boughs, O tree of glory, thy relaxing sinews bend. For a while the ancient rigor that thy birth bestowed suspend, and the king of heavenly beauty on thy bosom gently tend. Thou alone wast counted worthy this world's ransom to uphold, for a shipwrecked world preparing harbor like the ark of old, with the sacred blood anointed from the wounded lamb that rolled. Footnote. A verse is added by some, which, though not original, seems ancient. When, O judge of this world coming, in thy glory all divine, thou shalt bid thy cross's trophy, bright above the stars to shine, be the light and the salvation of the people that are thine. End of footnote. Laud and honor to the Father, laud and honor to the Son, Laud and honor to the Spirit, ever three and ever one, consubstantial, co-eternal, while unending ages run. End of section one. Section number two of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Vexilla Regis Prodiunt Venatius Fortunatus About 580 this world-famous hymn, one of the grandest in the treasury of the Latin Church, was composed by Fortunatus 
on occasion of the reception of certain relics by s gregory of tours and s ragdon previously to the consecration of a church at poictiers it is therefore strictly and primary a processional hymn though very naturally afterwards adapted to passion tide the royal banners forward go the cross shines forth with mystic glow where he in flesh our flesh who made our sentence bore our ransom paid where deep for us the spear was dyed life's torrent rushing from his side to wash us in the precious flood where mingled water flowed and blood fulfilled is all that david told in true prophetic song of old amidst the nations god saith he hath reigned and triumphed from the tree footnote in the italic version the tenth verse of the ninety-sixth palm is tell it out among the heathen that the lord reigneth from the tree s justin martyr accuses the jews of corrupting the text and Teratalian, in at least three places, quotes the other reading. End footnote. O tree of beauty, tree of light, O tree with royal purple dight, Elect upon whose faithful breast Those holy limbs should find their rest, On whose dear arms so wildly flung The weight of this world's ransom hung the price of humankind to pay and spoil the spoiler of his prey o cross our one reliance hail this holy passion tide avail to give fresh merit to the saint and pardon to the penitent from every spirit praises be to god the blessed trinity whom by the cross thou dost restore preserve and govern evermore footnote these verses were added when the hymn was appropriated to passion tide the ending of fortunatus is this with fragrance dropping from each bough sweeter than sweetest nectar thou decked with fruit of peace and praise and glorious with triumphal lays hail altar Hail, O victim, thee, debts now thy passion's victory, where life for sinners death endured, and life by death for man procured. The last two lines are substituted in the modern Roman breviary for the concluding half of the first verse. The poet had possibly the distich of said Julius in his eye. Vita, beta, nisium, miseris, avertir, venit, pertulit, a uh, miseris, vita, beta, nisium. End footnote. End of section two. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number three of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. A parabit repentia magna dies domini, 7th century. This rugged but grand judgment hymn is at least as early as the 7th century, because quoted by V. Betty. Footnote, there is another hymn also quoted by V. Betty of the same rhythm and style as this, probably of the same date and perhaps by the same author. 
I should have added it here, but for its great length. It begins hinnum dicta turba fratrum hymnum cantus personet. End footnote. It manifestly contains the germ of the dies iri, to which, however, inferior in lyric fever and effect, it scarcely yields in devotion and simple realization of its subject. In the original, it is acrostic. That great day of wrath and terror, that last day of woe and doom, like a thief that comes at midnight, on the sons of men shall come, when the pride and prop of ages all shall utterly have passed, and they stand in anguish owning that the end is here at last, and the trumpet's pealing clangor through the earth for quarters spread, waxing loud and ever louder, shall convoke the quick and dead, and the king of heavenly glory shall assume his throne on high, and the cohorts of his angels shall be near him in the sky, and the sun shall turn to sackcloth, and the moon be red as blood, and the stars shall fall from heaven, as the dead leaves in a wood, flame and fire and desolation at the judge's feet shall go, earth and sea and all abysses shall his mighty sentence know. Then the elect upon the right hand of the Lord shall stand around, but like goats the evil doers shall upon the left be found. Come ye blessed, take the kingdom, shall be there the king's award, which for you before the world was, of my father was prepared. I was naked, and ye clothed me, poor, and ye relieved me. Hence, take the riches of my glory for your endless recompense. Then the righteous shall make question, When have we beheld thee poor, Lord of glory? When relieved thee, lying needy at our door? Whom the blessed king shall answer, When ye showed your charity, giving bread and home and raiment, what ye did was done to me. In like manner to the left hand, that most righteous judge shall say, Go ye cursed to Gehenna, and the fire that is for a, For in prison ye came not to me, poor ye pitied not my lot. Naked ye have never clothed me, sick ye visited me not. They shall say, O Christ, when saw we that thou calledest for our aid, and in prison, or sick, or hungry, to relieve have we delayed? Whom again the judge shall answer, since ye never cast your eyes on the sick and poor and needy, it was me ye did despise. Backward, backward at the sentence, to Gehenna they shall fly, where the fire is never quenched, where the warm can never die, where are Satan and his angels in profoundest dungeon bound, where are cries and chains and gnashing, where are quenchless flames around. But the righteous upward soaring to the heavenly land shall go, midst the cohorts of the angels, where is joy forevermore. To Jerusalem exulting, they with shouts shall enter in, that true sight of peace and glory that sets free from grief and sin. 
Christ shall they behold forever, seated at the Father's hand. As in beautific vision, his elect before him stand. Wherefore man, while yet thou mayest, from the dragon's malice fly. Give thy bread to feed the hungry, if thou seekest to win the sky. Let thy loins be straightly girded, life be pure and heart be right. At the coming of the bridegroom, that thy lamp may glitter bright. End of section 3. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 4 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Sancte Venite Corpus Christi Sumite. Seventh Century. Rugged and unpoetical as this hymn is, it has a certain pious simplicity about it which renders it well worthy of preservation. It is an early example of a metrical composition, sung during the communion of the people. The communio of the Latin, like the cononicon of the Eastern Church, never now appears but as prose. The present hymn seems not later than the seventh century. Draw nigh and take the body of the Lord and drink the holy blood for you outpoured. Saved by that body, hallowed by that blood, whereby refreshed we render thanks to God. Salvation's giver, Christ the only Son, by that his cross and blood the victory won. Offered was he for greatest and for least, himself the victim and himself the priest. Victims were offered by the law of old, that in a type celestial mysteries told. He, ransomer from death, in light from shade, giveth his holy grace his saints to aid. Approach ye then with faithful hearts sincere, and take the safeguard of salvation here. He that in this world rules his saints and shields, to all believers life eternal yields. With heavenly bread makes them that hunger whole, gives living waters to the thirsty soul. Alpha and Omega, to whom shall bow all nations at the doom, is with us now. End of section 4 Section 5 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by E. Sharp Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal Hymnum Canentes Martyrum Venerable Bede, died 735 A Hymn for the Holy Innocence, the composition of Venerable Bede. Although it stands in unfavorable contrast with the Salvet de Flores Martyrum of Prudentius, it is somewhat strange that no part of it should have been introduced into any English breviary. It will be observed that the first and last line of every two verses are identical. This somewhat frigid conceit, epinalepsis as the grammarians call it, Venerable Bede seems to have borrowed from the elegy of Sedulius, which is composed on a similar plan. Other medieval writers, however, as Peter Damien, Eugenius of Toledo, Theodolf of Orleans have employed it. I have omitted some of the stanzas. The hymn for conquering martyrs raise, The victor innocence we praise, Whom in their woe earth cast away, But heaven with joy received today. Whose angels see the Father's face, World without end, and hymn his grace. And while they chant unceasing lays, The hymn for conquering martyrs raise. By that accursed monarch slain, their loving maker bade them reign. With him they dwell, no more distressed, in the fair land of light and rest. He gives them mansions, one and all, in that his heavenly father's hall. 
Thus have they changed their loss for gain, By that accursed monarch slain. A voice from Rama was there sent, A voice of weeping and lament, When Rachel mourned the children sore, Whom for the tyrant's sword she bore. Triumphal is their glory now, Whom earthly torments could not bow. What time, both far and near that went, A voice from Rama was there sent. Fear not, O little flock, and blessed, The lion that your life oppressed. To heavenly pastures ever new, The heavenly shepherd leadeth you. Who, dwelling now on Sion's hill, The lamb's fair footsteps follow still, By tyrant there no more distressed, Fear not, O little flock, and blessed. And every tear is wiped away By your dear father's hands for a Death hath no power to hurt you more, Whose own is life's eternal store, Who, their good seed forthcasting, weep, In everlasting joy shall reap, What time they shine in heavenly day, And every tear is wiped away. Footnote Venerable Bede is very fond of a practice not very usual in the hymns we are considering, the introducing the words of Scripture as a part of his own composition, and the additions he makes to them are sometimes very beautiful. Here, for example, Qui seminant in lacrimis, longo metent in gaudio. Again, in a fine hymn on the Ascension, Mirata adhue celestium, rogavit aula civium. Quis inquit et rex gloriae, rex iste tam laudabilis. End of footnote. O city blessed o'er all the earth, who gloriest in the Saviour's birth, whose are his earliest martyrs dear, by kindred and by triumph here. None from henceforth may call thee small, of rival towns thou passest all, in whom our monarch had his birth. O city blessed o'er all the earth. End of section 5。section 6 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by E. Sharp Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal Urbs Beata Jerusalem, 8th Century This grand hymn of the 8th century was modernized in Pope Urban's reform into the Celestis Urbs Jerusalem and lost half of its beauty in the process. Blessed City, Heavenly Salem, Vision dear of peace and love, Who of living stones upbuilded, Art the joy of heaven above, And with angel cohorts tended, As a bride to earth dost move, Coming new from highest heaven, Ready for the nuptial bed, Decked with jewels to his presence, By her lord shall she be led. All her streets and all her bulwarks of pure gold are fashioned. Bright with pearls her portal glitters, It is open evermore. And by virtue of her merits, There each faithful soul may soar, Who for Christ's dear name In this world pain and tribulation bore. Many a blow and biting sculpture, Polished well those stones elect, In their places now compacted, by the mighty architect, who therewith hath willed forever that his palace should be decked. Christ is made the sure foundation and the precious cornerstone, who the twofold walls surmounting binds them closely into one, holy Sion's acceptation and her confidence alone. All that dedicated city, dearly loved by God on high, in exultant jubilation pours perpetual melody. God the One and God the Trinal, lauding everlastingly. To this temple, where we call thee, come, O Lord of hosts, today, with thy wonted loving-kindness, 
hear thy servants as they pray, and thy fullest benediction shed within these walls for a. Footnote. Daniel imagines these stanzas to be a later addition when the hymn, originally general, was adapted to the dedication of a church. Mr. Trench, on the contrary, will have the whole poem to be of one date, and alleges, very truly, that this mixture of the earthly and heavenly temple is usual in hymns and sequences on a similar subject. Nevertheless, I think that Daniel is right. One, because there is a clear difference in the style and language of the two last and seven first stanzas. Two, because the transition from one part to the other is so unusually abrupt. Three, because at the end of the sixth stanza, there is a quasi-doxology as if to point out that the hymn originally concluded there. End of footnote. Here let all thy people merit, that they supplicate to gain, here to have and hold forever those good things their prayers obtain, and hereafter in thy glory with thy blessed ones to reign. Laud and honor to the Father, Laud and honor to the Son, Laud and honor to the Spirit, Ever three and ever one, Consubstantial, co-eternal, While unending ages run. Footnote There is, in the Paris breviary, A refacimento of this hymn, Very inferior, it is true, to the original, But much superior to the Roman reform, the first verse may serve as an example. Original Urbs beata Jerusalem, dicta pacis visio, quae construitur in cielo vivis ex lapidibus, et angelis coronata ut sponsata comite. Roman Celestis urbs Jerusalem, beata pacis visio, quae celsa de viventibus saxis ad astra toleris, Sponsaeque ritu kingeris, mille angelorum milibus. Paris, urbs beata, vera pacis, visio Jerusalem, quanta surgit, celsa saxis, conditur viventibus, quae polivit, haec coaptat, sedibus suis Deus. End of footnote. End of section six. Section 7 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by E. Sharp Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal Gloria, Laus et Honor St. Theodulf of Orleans, died 821. This processional hymn for Palm Sunday is said to have been composed by St. Theodulf at Metz, or, as others will have it, at Angers, while imprisoned on a false accusation, and to have been sung by him from his dungeon window, or by choristers instructed by him as the Emperor Louis and his court were on their way to the cathedral. The good bishop was immediately liberated. In the original composition there were ten stanzas besides the chorus. The Roman Missal retains only the first five. Others add, as I have here added, the sixth and the tenth. The remaining three are utterly unworthy of the general beauty of the hymn. I have to acknowledge the assistance of a friend in the translation. Glory and honor and laud be to thee, King Christ the Redeemer, children before whose steps raised their hosannas of praise. Glory and honor and laud be to thee, King Christ the Redeemer, children before whose steps raised their hosannas of praise. Israel's monarch art thou, and the glorious offspring of David, thou that approachest a king blessed in the name of the Lord, Glory and honor and laud be to thee, King Christ the Redeemer, children before whose steps raised their hosannas of praise. 
Glory to Thee in the highest, the heavenly armies are singing. Glory to Thee upon earth, man and creation reply. Glory and honor and laud be to Thee, King Christ the Redeemer, children before whose steps raised their hosannas of praise. Met Thee with palms in their hands that day, the folk of the Hebrews. We with our prayers and our hymns now to Thy presence approach. Glory and honor and laud be to Thee, King Christ the Redeemer, children before whose steps raised their hosannas of praise. They to Thee proffered their praise for to herald Thy dolorous passion. We to the King on His throne utter the jubilant hymn. Glory and honor and laud be to Thee, King Christ the Redeemer, children before whose steps raised their hosannas of praise. They were then pleasing to Thee, unto Thee our devotion be pleasing. Merciful King, kind King, who in all goodness art pleased, glory and honor and laud be to Thee, King Christ the Redeemer, children before whose steps raised their hosannas of praise. They in their pride of descent were rightly the children of Hebrews. Hebrews are we, whom the Lord's Passover maketh the same. Glory and honor and laud be to Thee, King Christ the Redeemer, children before whose steps raised their hosannas of praise. Footnote. This is partly a reference to Christ, our true Passover, partly to Hebrew, as derived from Heber, interpreted by passage. End of footnote. Victory won o'er the world be to us for our branches of palm tree, that in the conqueror's joy this to thee still be our song. Glory and honor and laud be to thee, King Christ the Redeemer, children before whose steps raised their hosannas of praise. End of section 7、section、eight、of Medieval Hymns and Sequences This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Tibi Christi Splendor Patris, Beatus Rabanus Maurus, died 856. A hymn of Saint Rabanus Maurus, Archbishop of Mayence, born in 777 and deceased in 856. It was so completely altered in the Te Splendor et Virtus Patris of the modern Roman breviary that scarcely a trace of the original remains. The Christe qui sedes Olimpo of Santolius Victorinus in the Parisian breviary imitates without equaling the present hymn. This is one of the few that have no rhyme. Thee, O Christ, the Father's splendor, life and virtue of the heart. In the presence of the angels, sing we now with voice and art, meetly in alternate chorus, bearing our responsive part. Thus we laud with veneration all the armies of the sky, chiefly him, the warrior primate of celestial chivalry, Michael, who in princely virtue cast a baton from on high, by whose watchful care repelling king of everlasting grace. Every ghostly adversary, all things evil, all things base, grant us of thine only goodness in thy paradise a place. Laud and honor to the Father, laud and honor to the Son, laud and honor to the Spirit, ever three and ever one, consubstantial, co-eternal, while unending ages run. End of section eight. Section number nine of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Lauda Matter. Ecclesia, Saint Odo, 
of Cluny. This hymn for S. Mary Magdalene's Day was the composition of S. Odo of Cluny, one of the brightest lights of that great monastery. It found its way into the York Breviary. The variation of rhyme occurs in the original. Exult, O Mother Church, today, the clemency of Christ the Lord, by sevenfold grace who wipes away the guilt of sevenfold crimes aboard. Sister of Lazarus that was dead, she that in such transgressions fell, up to the gates of life was led, even from the very jaws of hell. The great physician she pursues, bearing the precious ointment cruise, and by his only word is she from manifold disease set free. With heart dissolved in penitence, and tears that flowed apace, she came, and piety of deed, and thence she found the cure of sin and shame. Pardon of guilt hath made her soul a golden for an earthen bowl, and for a vessel of disgrace a precious vessel finds its place. To Christ arisen from the dead, and death's great conqueror as she pressed, his earliest sight she merited, who loved him more than all the rest. To God alone be honor paid, for grace so multiform displayed. Their guilt he pardons who repent, and gives reward for punishment. End of section 9. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 10 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Chorus Nove. Jerusalem, B. Fulbert of Charters, died about 1029. This Paschal hymn, the composition of S. Fulbert of Charters, is not common in continental breviaries, but was adopted in our own, where it occurs in the first vespers of Low Sunday. Thou New Jerusalem on high, break forth in sweet new melody, that we may keep from woe released with sober joy our paschal feast. When Christ, unconquered lion, first, the dragon's chains by rising burst, that while with living voice he cries, the dead of former times might rise. Footnote. This alluded to the medieval belief, to which we shall again have occasion to refer, that the lion's whelps are born dead, but that their father, by roaring over them the third day, raises them to life. And footnote. Swallowed in other years, his prey must Tartarus restore today. And many an exiled band set free with Jesus leaves captivity. Right gloriously he triumphs now, worthy to whom should all things bow, who, joining heaven and earth again, makes one republic of the twain. This praise as we, his soldiers, sing, tis ours to supplicate the king that in his palace bright and vast we may keep watch and ward at last. Long as unending ages run, to God the Father loud be done, 
to God the Son are equal praise with God the Paraclet. We raise. End of section 10. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 11 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Audi nos Rex Christe, 11th century. A Song of Pilgrims, published by Madame du Meril, from a manuscript of the 11th century. O Christ, our King, give ear. O Lord and Maker, hear, and guide our footsteps, lest they stray. Chorus. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy on us, Lord, and guide our footsteps, lest they stray. O ever three in one, protect our course begun, and lead us on our holy way. Thy faithful guardian send, thy angel who may tend, and bring us to thy holy seat. Defend our onward path, protect from hostile wrath, and to our land return our feet. Thy right hand be stretched out, thy left be round about, in every peril that we meet. And, O oh good Lord, at last, our many wanderings past, give us to see thy realm of light. Glory to God on high, be paid eternally, in laud and majesty and might. End of section 11 Section 12 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Gravi me terror, pulsus, vitae dies ultima. Saint Peter Damien died ten seventy two. This awful hymn, the Dies Irae of individual life, was written by S. Peter Damien, Cardinal Bishop of Ostia, the great code. Jutor of S. Gregory the Seventh, in his reform of the church. He lived from 1002 to 1072 and spent the last years of his life in devotion and retirement at the Abbey of S. Cro de Alavano, having resigned his cardinalate. His realization of the hour of death is shown not only by this hymn, but by the commendatory prayer used from his time in the Roman Church, which begins, To God I command thee, beloved brother, and to him whose creature thou art I commit thee, originally composed by S. Peter as a letter to a dying friend. O oh, what terror in thy forethought, ending scene of mortal life. Heart is sickened, reins are loosened, thrills each nerve with terror rife. When the anxious heart depicteth all the anguish of the strife, who the spectacle can image, how tremendous of that day. When the course of life accomplished, from the trammels of her clay, rise the soul to be delivered, agonized to pass away. Sense hath perished, tongue is rigid, eyes are filming or in death, palpitates the breast and hoarsely gasps the rattling throat for breath. Limbs are torpid, lips are pallid, breaking nature quithereth. All come round him, cogitation, 
Habit, word, and deed are there. All, though much and sore he'd struggle, hover o'er him in the air. Turn he this way, turn he that way, on his inmost soul they glare. Conscience self her culprit tortures, gnawing him with pangs unknown. For that now amendment's season is forever past and gone, and that late repentance findeth pardon none for all its moan. Fleshly lusts of fancied sweetness are converted into gall. When on brief and bitter pleasure, everlasting dollars fall. Then, what late appeared so mighty, oh, how infinitely small! Christ, unconquered King of glory, thou my wretched soul relieve. In that most extremest terror, when the body she must leave. Let the accuser of the brethren, or me, then no power receive. Let the prince of darkness vanish, and Gehenna's legions fly. Shepherd thou thy sheep, thus ransomed, to thy country lead on high, where forever in fruition I may see the eye to eye. Amen. End of section 12. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 13 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Crux Mundi Benedictio. St. Peter Damien died 1072. S. Peter Damien in almost all his compositions, seems to have had his eye on some earlier hymn. In the present case, he clearly follows the Vexilla Regis. The following does not seem to have been publicly used by the church. O cross, by whom the earth is blessed, certain redemption, hope, and rest, once as the tree of torture known, now the bright gate to Jesus throne. On thee the host was lifted high, who to himself drew all men nigh, whom this world's prince in malice sought, and in him of his own found not. The law that in thy form begins, Blots out the writing of our sins. Our ancient servitude is o'er, And freedom is restored once more. Thy savor is more precious far Than sweetest scents of spices are, The nectar that from thee distills, The bosom with its fragrance fills. Footnote the poet has in his eye the stanza of Fort Unatus, not now used, which was given in the note on page 8. End footnote. Thou by thy cross, O Christ, we pray, to life's reward direct our way, who of old time upon the tree our ransom didst vouchsafe to be. The unbegotten Father's praise, and the begotten Son's we raise. An equal laud and glory be, Spirit of both, for A to Thee. Amen. 
End of section 13. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 14 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Civis Colestus Patriae, Marbodus of Wren, died 1125. The ruggedness of the translation is merely a copy of that of the original in the following poem of Marbodus, successfully Archdeacon of Angiers and Bishop of Rennes, who died in 1125. Its title, a prose clearly proves it to have been intended, if not used, as a sequence in the mass of some high festival, probably a dedication. The mystical explanation of precious stones is the subject of the good bishop's poem De Grimi, which seems in its time to have obtained a high reputation. The prose which I here give is certainly not without its beauty, and is a good key to medieval allusions of a similar kind. Ye of the heavenly country sing the praise and honor of your king. The razor to its glorious height of that celestial city bright in whose fair building stand displayed the gems for twelve foundations laid. The bright green hue of jasper saith, how flourishing the estate of faith, which in all them that perfect be shall never wither utterly, in whose firm keeping safe we fight. With Satan's wile and Satan's might. Footnote. The twelve foundation stones of the apocalypse gave rise, as might be expected, to an infinite variety of mystical interpretations. Marbodus wrote a short commentary on the prose which we are considering, which will serve as a good explanation of it. His treatment of the foundation stones is topological. A more usual one is allegorical, which I will give from the commentary of Michael Allegan on the Psalms. Jasper, says the comment of Marbodus, is the first foundation of the Church of God and is of a green color. Whoever hath it upon him, no phantasm can hurt him. It signifies those who always hold the faith of God and never depart from it or wither, but are always flourishing therein and fear not the assaults of the devil. Allegorically, the jasper, the first foundation stone which promotes fecundity and causes unity symbolizes the first article of the creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And footnote. The azure light of sapphire stone resembles that celestial throne, a symbol of each simple heart the grass in hope, the better part, whose life each holy deed combines, and in the light of virtue shines. Footnote. The sapphire, says Marbodus, is of the color of the sky. It signifies that, while they be yet on earth, 
set their affections on things above. And despite things terrestrial, according to that saying, our conversation is in heaven. The reason why in the prose it is compared to the throne of God is clearly that verse in Exodus. They saw the God of heaven, and under his feet was as it were the paved work of a sapphire stone. The sapphire, says a guin, which reconciles, heals, consoles, gives sight, and is the king of stones, symbolizes the second article of the creed. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And footnote. Like fire, though pale in outward show, shall Sidoni at length shall glow. Carried abroad its radiant streams, at home in shade it hides its gleams. It marks their holiness and grace, who do good deeds in secret place. Footnote, the Chalcedony Marbodis continues, While it is in a house doth not shine, when under the open air it glitters brightly, it resists those that would cut it or stretch it, when heated either by the sun or by rubbing with the finger, it attracts straws, by this they are signified who do their good deeds in secret, as fasting, alms, and the like. According to that saying, But thou, when thou fastest, etc., but when such men are compelled to go abroad into the world, then their good works shine before men. But if any seek to flatter them which is as it were to paint or engrave them, they receive not their vain praises, but manfully resist and acquiesces not in them. And when heeded either by the sun, which is Christ, or by the fingers, that is by the gifts of the Holy Ghost, they, by word and example, draw straws that is sinners to themselves and cause them to persevere in good works. The Chalcedony says a guin, which is pale, sets forth humility, and so the third article of the creed, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. And footnote. The emerald burns intensely bright with radiance of an olive light. This is the faith that highest shines. No deed of charity declines and seek no rest and shuns no strife in working out a holy life. Footnote. The emerald is the comment of Marbodus is exceeding green, surpassing all gems and herbs in greenness. It is found only in a dry and unhabitable country. Through the bitterness of its cold, nothing can dwell there but griffins, and one-eyed Arimus that fight with them. By the emerald we understand those who excel others in the vigor of their faith and dwell among infidels, who be frigid and arid in love. The griffins that keep watch over them be devils, who envy them that have this precious gem of faith, and do their diligence to deprive them thereof. Against these fight the one-eyed Arimus, that is, those who go not to ways, nor have a double heart, nor serve two lords. Aguin, again, the emerald which heals, gives eloquence, riches, conquests, clears sight, 
fortifies memory, banishes luxury and sorrow, typifies the passion of our Lord, which spiritually doth all these things. And therefore, that article of the creed suffered under Pontius Pilate. The barrel of the new Jerusalem is described in two of the most beautiful lines ever written by Prudentius. Has interspecies smargandina gramine verno prata virent volvic vagos lux herbida flectus in footnote sardonyx with its threefold hue sets forth the inner man to view where dark humility is seen and chastity with snow white sheen and scarlet marks his joy to bleed in martyrdom if faith shall need footnote the sardonyx says marbodus has three colors the lowest black the middle white the upper red and it signifies those who sustain grief of heart for the name of christ and are white that is without gull within and yet to themselves appear contemptible and as it were black that is sinners a guin after the same description proceeds the lower part which is black typifies the sorrow of good friday the middle part which is white the rest of easter eve and the upper which is red the glory of easter day thus the whole symbolizes the fifth article as he reckons it of the creed was crucified dead and buried he descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead in footnote the sardius with its purple red sets forth their merits who have bled the martyr ban now blessed above that agonize for jesus love the sixth foundation not in vain the cross's mystery to explain footnote because the number six is symbolical of our lord's passion since he was crucified at the sixth hour of the sixth day the sardius continues our poet which is wholly red signifies the martyrs who pour forth their blood for christ the sardius says aguin as being a bright stone sets forth the joy of the sixth article of the creed he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of god the father almighty in footnote the golden colored crystal light flashes forth sparkles on the night it's a mystic hues the life reflect of men with perfect wisdom decked who shine in this world's night like gold through that blessed spirit sevenfold footnote the chrysolite marboas teaches shines as gold and emits fiery sparkles it signifies the wise and charitable who impart to others that which they possess themselves for wisdom and charity excel other virtues as gold other metals aguin is more ingenious the chrysolite shines as gold in the day as fire in the night by the day the good by the gold their crown are represented by the night the wicked and by the fire their punishment hence the stone typifies their final separation and thus the seventh article of the creed from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead in footnote the sunshine on the sea displays the watery barrels fainter rays 
of those in this world's wisdom wise, the thoughts and hopes it signifies, who long to live more fully blessed with mystic peace of endless rest. Footnote. The barrel, according to our author, shines as water that reflects the sun and warms the hand that holds it. It signifies those who are frail by nature, but being enlightened by the sun of righteousness, shine with good works and warm others by the example of their love. Aguin says the barrel whose virtue is to cause love, to bestow power, and confer healing, sets forth the eighth article, I believe in the Holy Ghost. And footnote. Beyond all gems the topaz rare, hath value thence beyond compare. It shines, albeit, of color gray, clear as a fair ethereal ray and notes the part of them that live, the solid life, contemplative. Footnote. The topaz, says Marbotus, whose commentary in this case does not well agree with his text, is rare and therefore precious. It has two colors, one like gold, the other clearer. In clearness, it surpasses all gems, and nothing is more beautiful. It signifies those who love God and their neighbor. According to Aguin, the topaz, which receives as in a vessel the light of the sun, symbolizes that which thus stores up the rays of the sun of righteousness, the holy Catholic Church. End footnote. Some council decked in purple state, the chrysophase doth imitate. In the fair tint, its face that decks, tis intertinged with golden specks. This is the perfect love that knows, kindest return to sternest foes. Footnote. Marbodus, the chrysophasus, which is purple with drops of gold, signifies those who pass their life in tribulation and passion, yet constantly abide in charity. According to Aguin, this stone A shines like fire, and B communicates its virtues without diminishing them, and thus typifies A, the communion of saints, and B, the forgiveness of sins, and footnote. The azure jacinth comes between the brighter and the dimmer sheen, the ardor of whose varied ray is changed with every changing day. The angelic life it brings to view, attempered with discretion due. Footnote. The jacinth says Marboas, changes its appearance with that of the sky. It therefore represents those who, like the apostle, can preach wisdom among them that are perfect, and yet have milk for babes in Christ. Thus, he observes, S. Paul was a Jacinth, for he became all things to all men. Aguin teaches that the Jacinth has the virtue of invigorating and therefore is a type of the resurrection of the body. In footnote. Last in the holy city set, with hue of glorious violet, forth from the amethyst are rolled, sparks crimson bright and flames of gold. The humble heart it signifies that with its dying master dies. Footnote. The Amasis, according to Marboas, is entirely red and shoots out rosy flames. Its color signifies earthly sufferings. Its emissions 
prayers for those that cause it. For he says it is the virtue of virtues to pray for our persecutors. And we read of few that have done so. Yet there are two in the Old Testament, Moses and Samuel, and two in the New, the Lord Christ and Stephen. A Ewan, affirming the emesis to give a clear sight, makes it symbolical of the beautific vision, and thus of life everlasting. I add the French verses of Marbodus on the same subject, with one or two corrections for the sake of the rhyme. Ici sunt nom les deux pierres, qui sunt temu les plus chers. Jasp, saphir, Calcidoin, Smaragud, Sard, a Sardoin, Chrysolit, Berel, a Topaz, Amethyst, Jacinth, a Christopas, D. Saint M. Portant Figure, Qui du Servant Saint Poir, Qui du voudra sever, comme de pierre sin clasure, en la city deu sera pose, e el fundament bien allo, en vision de paz reposera, en la cal se fi jor pora, en footnote. These stones arrayed in goodly row set forth the deeds of men below. The various tents that there have place, the multiplicity of grace. Who in himself such grace displays may shine with these in endless rays. Jerusalem, dear peaceful land, these for thy twelve foundations stand. Blessed and nigh to God is he, who shall be counted worthy thee, that guardian slumbereth not, nor sleeps, who in his charge thy turrets keep. King of the heavenly city blessed, grant that thy servants may have rest. This changeful life forever past, and consort with thy saints at last, that we, with all the choir above, may sing thy power and praise thy love. Amen. End of section 14. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 15 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Leta Bundus, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, died 1153. This sequence, or hymn, for while it was used abroad as the former, in England it was employed as the latter, of rare perfection in its kind, and perhaps as widely known as any hymn of the church is S. Bernard's. It was appropriated to the festival of the Assumption, though clearly intended for that of Christmas. Be the tidings by the choir of faithful rooted. Alleluia! Monarch's monarch sprang from maiden unpolluted. Mighty wonder! Angel of the council, he from a virgin dean to be, son 
from star. Sun that never knoweth night. Star than stars most clear and bright. Clearer far. As a star evolves a ray, thus the virgin, this blessed day, bear the child, nor the star by ray sent forth, nor the virgin by that birth was defiled. Lebanon's tall cedar now, to the hyssop deans to bow, here below, word, that all to being spake, incarnation for our sake, deem to know. Though Isaiah tell the deed, though the synagogue may read, yet thereof she takes no heed, ever blind. If she do her prophets wrong, spurning all the witness throng, still the Deed in Sybil's song, let her find. Turn Judea and repent, credit ancient prophets sent. Why upon destruction bent, wretched race? Own the monarch by the tongue, of the seers in old time sung. Own him from a virgin sprung, full of grace. End of section 15. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 16 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal Hic Brevi Vivitor Bernardo Cluny, 12th Century Footnote I have no hesitation in saying that I look on these verses of Bernard as the most lovely, in the same way that the Dies Ere is the most sublime, and the Stabat Mater the most pathetic of medieval poems. They are even superior to that glorious hymn on the same subject, the De Gloria et Gaudis Paradisi of St. Peter Damien. For the sake of comparison, I quote some of the most striking stanzas of the latter, availing myself of the admirable translation of Mr. Wackerbarth. There nor waxing moon nor waning, sun nor stars in courses bright, for the Lamb to that glad city shines in everlasting light. There the daylight beams forever, all unknown are time and night. For the saints in beauty beaming shine in light and glory pure, crowned in triumphs, flushing honors, joy in unison secure, and in safety tell their battles and their foes' discomfiture. Freed from every stain of evil, all their carnal wars are done, for the flesh made spiritual and the soul agree in one. Peace unbroken spreads enjoyment, Sin and scandal are unknown. Here they live in endless being. Passingness has passed away. Here they bloom, they thrive, they flourish, for decayed is all decay. Lasting energy hath swallowed darkling death's malignant sway. Though each one's respective merit hath its varying palm assigned, love takes all as his possession, where his power hath all combined, so that all that each possesses all partake in unconfined. Christ thy soldier's palm of honor, unto this thy city free. Lead me when my warfare's girdle I shall cast away from me, a partaker in thy bounty, with thy blessed ones to be. Grant me vigor while I labor, in the ceaseless battle pressed, that thou mayst the conflict over, grant me everlasting rest, and I may at length inherit thee my portion ever blessed. With the above, it is worthwhile to compare some of the concluding stanzas of the Christ Triumph After Death of Giles Fletcher, who clearly had St. Peter Damien's poem in his mind. Here may the band that now in triumph shines, and that before they were invested thus, in earthly bodies carried heavenly minds, pitch round about, in order glorious, their sunny tents 
and houses luminous, all their eternal day in songs and joying, joying their end without end of their joying, while their almighty prince destruction is destroying. No sorrow now hangs clouding on their brow, no bloodless malady impales their face, no age drops on their hair his silver snow, no nakedness their bodies doth embase no poverty themselves and theirs disgrace no fear of death the joy of life devours no unchaste sleep their precious time deflowers no loss no grief no change wait on their winged hours but now their naked bodies scorn the cold and from their eyes joy looks and laughs at pain the infant wonders how he came so old the old man how he came so young again where all are rich and yet no gold they owe and all are kings, and yet no subjects know, all full, and yet no time on food they do bestow. For things that pass are past. Manifestly the nam transiri transiit of St. Peter, as the wonder of the infant and the old man, is simply a development of the nam minute non deformes of Hildebert. But in the stanza that follows, Fletcher has the advantage over Bernard, Hildebert, and Damien, by his sublime allusion to the beatific vision. In mist of the city celestial, where the eternal temple should have rose, lightened the idea beatifical, end and beginning of each thing that grows, whose self no end, nor yet beginning knows, that hath no eyes to see, nor ears to hear, yet sees and hears, and is all eye, all ear, that nowhere is contained, and yet is everywhere. With respect to the poem of Bernard, Mr. Trent says very well, after referring to the ode of Casimir's, Orit me patrie decor, that both turn upon the same theme, the heavenly homesickness, but with all the classical beauty of the ode, and it is great, who does not feel the poor Cluniac monks is the more real and deeper utterance, that despite the strange form which he has chosen, he is the greater poet. The ode, however, is well worthy of translation, and here is an attempt. It kindles all my soul, my country's loveliness, those starry choirs that watch around the pole, and the moon's tender light in heavenly fires through golden halls that roll, O chorus of the night. O planets, sworn the music of the spheres to follow, lovely watchers that think scorn to rest till day appears me for celestial homes of glory born. Why here, O oh why so long, do ye behold an exile from on high? Here, O oh ye shining throng, with lilies spread the mound where I shall lie. Here let me drop my chain, and dust to dust returning, cast away the trammels that remain. The rest of me shall spring to endless day. There are two other passages in modern Latin poets which are well worthy perusal on a similar subject, though the principal part of their beauty lying rather in expression than in thought. I have not considered it worth while to translate them. I allude to the fourteenth elegy of the third book of the Suspiria Anime Amantis of Hermann Hugo, and to the tenth elegy of the first book of Jacobus Levicotius, which is entitled An Aspiration to the Celestial Country. End of footnote. The author of the poem whence these lines are taken was Bernard of Cluny, one of the smaller stars in that constellation of learning and piety which adorned France in the twelfth century. The poem itself consists of about three thousand lines, and is entitled On the Contempt of the World. The part which follows is near the conclusion. I have here deviated from my ordinary rule of adopting the measure of the original, because our language, if it could be tortured to any distant resemblance of its rhythm, would utterly fail to give any idea of the majestic sweetness which invests it in Latin. Its difficulty in that language is such that Bernard, in a preface, expresses his belief that nothing but the special inspiration of the Spirit of God could have enabled him to employ it through so long a poem. It is a dactylic hexameter, divided into three parts, between which a caesura is inimmissible. The hexameter has a tailed rhyme and feminine leonine rhyme between the two first clauses, thus, Tunc nova gloria, 
pectora sobria, clarificabit, salvit enigmata, verace sabata, continuabit, patria luminous, in sia turbinus, in sia litus, sive replet pitor, amplifica pitor, Israelitis. It often happens that the two first clauses will have a triple run, as O miserabilis, insatiabilis, insatiata, but this is merely accidental. The effect in English would be this, I quote from the beginning of the same poem. Time will be ending soon, heaven will be rending soon. Fast we, and pray we, comes the most merciful, comes the most terrible, watch we while we may. As it is evident that no labor nor skill could have given in such bonds anything approaching to an adequate idea of the beauty of Bernard's poem, I preferred a simple measure, the rather that the verses were not of that class which are intended for music. I should also add that I have very much abbreviated the original, and perhaps the lines that follow cannot claim to be more than a close imitation. Brief life is here our portion, brief sorrow, short-lived care. The life that knows no ending, the tearless life, is there. O oh, happy retribution, short toil, eternal rest, for mortals and for sinners, a mansion with the blessed that we should look, poor wanderers, to have our home on high, that worms should seek for dwellings beyond the starry sky. And now we fight the battle, and then we wear the crown of full and everlasting and passionless renown. Then glory yet unheard of shall shed abroad its ray, resolving all enigmas in endless Sabbath day. Then, then from his oppressors the Hebrew shall go free and celebrate in triumph the year of jubilee. And the sunlit land that recks not of tempest or of fight shall fold within its bosom each happy Israelite, missed power that knows no limit, and wisdom free from bound. The beatific vision shall glad the saints around, and peace, for war is needless, and rest, for storm is past, and gold from finished labor, and anchorage at last. Their God, my King, in portion, in fullness of His grace, shall we behold forever, and worship face to face. Their Jacob into Israel, from earthlier self estranged, and Leah into Rachel, forever shall be changed. There all the halls of Zion, for I shall be complete, and in the land of beauty all things of beauty meet. Footnote Leah and Rachel are allegorized in three different ways by medieval poets, one of the active and contemplative life, and thence also by an easy transition to the toil we endure on earth, and the eternal contemplation of God's glory in heaven, as here. So again in a fine but rugged prose in the Nuremberg Missal for St. Jerome's Day. Then when all carnal strife hath ceased, and we from warfare are released, O grant us in that heavenly feast to see thee as thou art, to Leah give the battle won, her Rachel's dearer heart, to Martha, when the strife is done, her Mary's better part. The parallel symbol of Martha and Mary is, however, in this sense far more common, and is even found in epitaphs, as in that to Gunreta de Warren, daughter of William the Conqueror, a Martha to the houseless poor, a Mary in her love, and though her Martha's part be gone, her Mary's lives above. Bernard, in the passage we are considering, has a double propriety in the changes of which he speaks. Israel, according to St. Augustine's rendering, means he that beholds God. Rachel, according to the unwarrantable medieval explanation, that beholds the beginning, i.e. Christ. Thus the change spoken of is from earth to the beatific vision and has a reference also to the new name and white stone of the Apocalypse. The second allegory of Leah and Rachel expounds them of the synagogue and the church. To this we shall have occasion to allude in a poem of Adam of St. Victor. The third makes them to represent earthly affliction patiently endured, succeeded by joy. So a contemporary poem on the martyrdom of St. Thomas, 
post agar ludibrium sarai natus dator post laham ad libitum jacob usurator end of footnote to thee o oh dear dear country mine eyes their vigils keep for very love beholding thy happy name they weep the mention of thy glory is unction to the breast in medicine and sickness and love and life and rest o oh one o oh onely mansion o oh paradise of joy where tears are ever banished and smiles have no alloy beside thy living waters all plants are great and small the cedar of the forest the hyssop of the wall with jaspers glow thy bulwarks thy streets with emeralds blaze the sartius and the topaz unite in thee their rays thy ageless walls are bonded with amethyst unpriced thy saints build up its fabric and the cornerstone is christ footnote it is not without a deep mystical meaning that these stones are selected by the poet as the reader will see by referring to pages forty three through forty seven end of footnote thou hast no shore fair ocean thou hast no time bright day dear fountain of refreshment to pilgrims far away upon the rock of ages they raise thy holy tower thine is the victor's laurel and thine the golden dower thou feel'st in mystic rapture o bride that knowest no guile the prince's sweet kisses the prince's loveliest smile unfading lilies bracelets of living pearl thine own the lamb is ever near thee the bridegroom thine alone in all thine endless leisure and sweetest accents sings the ills that were thy merit the joys that are thy kings jerusalem the golden with milk and honey blessed beneath thy contemplation sink heart and voice oppressed i know not oh i know not what social joys are there what radiancy of glory what light beyond compare and when i fain would sing them my spirit fails and faints and vainly would it image the assembly of the saints they stand those halls of zion conjubilant with song and bright with many an angel and many a martyr throng the prince is ever in them the light is eye serene the pastures of the blessed are decked in glorious sheen there is the throne of david and there from toil released the shout of them that triumph the song of them that feast and they beneath their leader who conquered in the fight forever and forever are clad in robes of white jerusalem the glorious the glory of the elect o dear and future vision that eager hearts expect even now by faith i see thee even here thy walls discern to thee my thoughts are kindled and strive and pant and yearn jerusalem the onely that looks from heaven below in thee is all my glory in me is all my woe and though my body may not my spirit seeks thee fain till flesh and earth return me to earth and flesh again o land that seest no sorrow o state that fearest no strife o princely bowers o land of flowers o realm and home of life End of section 16section 17 of medieval hymns and sequences this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by adrian stevens medieval hymns and sequences by john mason neal patris sapientia bonitas divina 12th century this is one and the best of the many efforts of medieval poets to recite our Lord's Passion in connection with the canonical hours. It may probably be of the twelfth century. Circled by his enemies, by his own forsaken, Christ the Lord at matin hour for our sakes was taken. Very wisdom, very light, monarch long expected, in the garden by the Jews, bound, reviled, rejected. See them at the hour of prime, unto Pilate leading, Him gainst whom with lying tongues witnesses are pleading. 
There with spitting and with shame, ill for good they render, marring of that face which gives heaven eternal splendor. Crucify him, for his love is their bitter payment, when they lead him forth at tears, clad in purple raiment, and a crown of woven thorns on his head he weareth, and the cross to Calvary on his shoulder beareth. He upon that cross at sects for man's sake was mounted, by the passers-by reviled, with transgressors counted, mocking vinegar and gall, to his thirst they proffer, to the holy Lamb of God such the taunt they offer. At the hour of nones the strife long and sharp was ended, gently to his father's hands he his soul commended, and a soldier pierced his side with a spear unbidden, and earth quaked exceedingly, and the sun was hidden. When it came to vesper time, from the cross they take him, whose great love to bear such woes for our sakes could make him, such a death he underwent, sin's alone physician, that of everlasting life we might have fruition. At the holy compline tide, holy hands array him, in the garments of the grave, where the mourners lay him, myrrh and spices have they brought, scripture is completed, and by death the prince of life, death and hell defeated. Therefore these canonical hours my tongue shall ever in thy praise, O Christ, recite, with my heart's endeavour, that the love which for my sake bear such tribulation, in mine own death agony, may be my salvation. Footnote. It is not to be wondered at that the above hymn should have received many applications to St. Mary. For example, one begins, Mary, mother of the poor and their hope unshaken, heard about the matin hour that her son was taken by the apostolic band, utterly forsaken, etc. More worthy of quotation are the following verses of Hildebert's on the same subject. The rudeness of the translation imitates that of the original. In twice twelve hours the sun goes through the heaven, and sacred to the Lord of all are seven. The first is prime, in this the sun was placed, on high and heaven with all his splendour graced. In this we praise our King, the world's true light, and pray him to defend from error's night. Adam at Tiers was made, and given the law, Tiers the Redeemer's condemnation saw, and the blessed Spirit's advent. Here we raise the vessels to the potter, prayer and praise, that casting off the old, that Adam now, we may put on, in death who deigned to bow, as at this very hour, the heavenly flame may purge from sin and fire with love our frame. That sects man fell and Christ his sentence bore, and the noon fiend is raging evermore. Whoever thou art, for whom Christ deigned to bleed, fall on thy knees and thank him for the deed. Pray that the dragon, who in this same hour Adam destroyed, or thee may have no power, that God at noon for man a sacrifice may shield thee from the flesh and fiend surprise. At nones by Adam paradise was lost, Christ on the cross at nones gave up the ghost and visited the faithful to reveal his marvellous light in shade. Thou therefore kneel and pray to join their band and see their Lord in the bright realms now lost and now restored. At Vesper tide the moon and stars displayed, in their bright course the firmament arrayed, for these fair signs we yield their author praise, for the cheered darkness and the lovely rays. At Vesper's wretched now and doomed to ills, Adam first saw the sunset touch the hills, and prayed as darkness gathered in apace, with horror struck for God's defending grace. So thou who at the font hast seen new light, pray that thy sun may never sink in night. No certain hour hath Compline, yet to God render we thanks for that day's journey trod.
forgiveness ask from grace, from grace request, that Satan with no phantasm break our rest, or earth at midnight hour the deluge burst, the fearful baptism of its sin accursed, Moses exulting past the Red Sea wave, where Pharaoh and his thousands found their grave, David arose to psalms at the same tide, shall the last fire the good and bad divide. These things of mercy and of judgment teach, the hymns and prayers of David mercy preach, that Moses passed in safety when his foes were whelmed like lead, judicial sentence shows. End footnote. End of section 17. Section 18 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Conam cum Discipulis, 12th century. The following prose is from the Salisbury Missal and occurs in the Mass of the Five Wounds. Daniel found it in the same Mass in a Missal of the Augustinian Hermits. In both editions it is exceedingly corrupt. It may safely be referred to the twelfth century. The very great difficulty of the measure, taken in connection with the exquisite simplicity of the original, which under any circumstances it would have been difficult, and in these it is almost impossible to preserve, made me hesitate as to including it in the present collection. But though much of the melody, and more, I fear, of the simple fervour may have been lost, I still think that it may not be without its value to English readers. At the supper with the twelve, thou, O Christ, wast seated, and hast prophesied thy death soon to be completed, and hast pointed Judas out by the morsel meted, and unto Gethsemane, after, hadst retreated. Prostrate fell the Lord of all, where he had proceeded, that the cup might pass away, earnestly he pleaded. But unto his father's will, that his own conceded, and forthwith a sweat of blood, o'er his members speeded. After that the traitor's kiss Judas came to proffer, Wherefore comest thou, friend? The Lord saith unto the scoffer, Thou to him whom thou hast sold, salutation offer, Thou who hadst the price of blood from his murderer's coffer. All the weary live long night, neither rest nor sleeping, Armed bands of soldiery watch round Jesus keeping, Priests and scribes upon his head foul reproaches heaping, Who might see the spotless lamb, and refrain from weeping? Pilate strives to free the Lord from the bands that tie him, but the voices of the Jews more and more defy him, and the tumult waxes still loud and louder by him, and the people's fiercer cry thunders, Crucify him! With the soldiers straightly bound, forth the Saviour fareth, over all his holy form, Bleeding wounds he beareth, He a crown of woven thorns, King of glory, weareth, And each one with bended knee Fresher taunts prepareth. They thy mild and tender flesh, O Redeemer, bearing, To the column bind thee fast, For the scourge preparing. Thus the ransom of our peace Cruel stripes are tearing, As the streams that flow therefrom Meetly are declaring. After passed he through the street, as the morn grew older, and the heavy, bitter cross bare he on his shoulder, thronged the windows and the doors, many a rude beholder, but he found no comforter there and no upholder. Him in open sight of men, manifestly shaming, to the wind and cold they bear, utmost insults framing, guiltless on the cross they lift, with transgressors naming, him as midmost of the three, chief of all proclaiming. 
On the wood his arms are stretched, and his hands are riven. Through the tender flesh of Christ mighty nails are driven. In like wise his blessed feet are to torture given, as the hands that had so oft in our battle striven. Streams of blood are trickling down from those holy sources. Hither, weak and sinful soul, and renew thy forces. This the medicine that shall cure terrors and remorses. This the writing that for us freedom's deed endorses. Then the Lord exclaimed, I thirst! Meat did scripture make it. On a reed they raise the sponge to the lips that spake it. Vinegar and gall they give to his thirst to slake it, which when he had tasted of, he refused to take it. Jesu, wondrous to the last, what was thine intention? Thou wast silent of the cross, but of thirst madest mention. Not that this thou feltest more than thy bitter tension, but that thirst thou wouldst express for lost man's invention. Calling on thy father's name, thy last breath was spended, and thy spirit in his hands gently was commended. With a loud and mighty cry, then thy head was bended, and the work that brought thee down of salvation ended. But by heart and soul of man that is past conceiving, how the virgin mother's soul inmostly was grieving, when the soldier's bitter lance that dear side was cleaving, cruel mark upon his frame of its passage leaving. That blessed form could feel no more, whence had life departed, t'was the mother's anguished soul neath the wound that smarted, when she marked how through his side that sharp lance was darted, and the streams of water thence, and of blood that started. Wherefore, sinner, haste to these fountains of salvation, life thou mayest draw therefrom, and illumination. Cure thou mayest find for sin, strength to meet temptation, refuge mayst thou gain against Satan's condemnation. End of section 18《We now proceed to Adam of St. Victor, of whom it is not necessary to say anything in this place, because I have already spoken of him in the preface. The sequence that follows is on the four evangelists. Faithful flock in whose possessing is your heavenly Father's blessing, gladness in his law progressing from Ezekiel's vision draw, John, the prophet's witness, sharing, in the apocalypse declaring, This I write, true record bearing, of the things I truly saw. Round the throne, midst angel natures, stand for holy living creatures, whose diversity of features maketh good the seer's plan. This an eagle's visage knoweth, that a lion's image showeth, scripture on the rest bestoweth, the twain forms of ox and man. Footnote. The evangelistic symbols offered, as might be expected, a favourite theme to medieval poets. Adam of St. Victor has himself another sequence on the same subject. It is no part of my design to dwell on the different adaptations of these symbols, how the lion is given to St. John, and St. Luke and St. Matthew, the man and the eagle to St. Mark, etc., I quote some of the verses of the Christian poets on the subject. Juvencus, if the lines are indeed his. Matthew of virtue's path is wont to tell, and gives the just man laws for living well. Mark loves to hover twixt the earth and sky, in vehement flight as eagle from on high. 
The Lord's blessed passion, Luke more fully writes, and named the ox of priestly deeds indicts. John, as a lion, furious for the strife, thunders the mysteries of eternal life. St. Mark's flying between the earth and sky is explained by the gloss thus, that he neither describes the temporal nativity of our Lord, represented by earth, nor his eternal generation, symbolized by heaven, but, so to speak, avoids both. Sedulius, a hundred years later, after speaking of our Lord's true manhood, says, This Matthew writes, and then the human face, Mark roars a lion in a desert place, while priestly Luke the ox for symbol names, and John, who towers to heaven, the eagle claims. Later poets carried out, as we shall see that Adam does, the symbolism still further, and made the Lord to be in himself all that his servants were separately, thus a medieval epigram. Luke is the ox, Mark lion, eagle John, Matthew the man, but God is all in one, the man in birth, the ox in death, to rise the lion, and the eagle seek the skies. Hildebert of Mont, after going through these symbols, adduces another. The fountain yet distills, increase thy store, each righteous man contains these symbols for, for human sense he claims the human face, the ox in self-denial finds a place, lion is he as conqueror in hard straits, eagle for oft he seeks the heavenly gates. End footnote. These are they, the symbols mystic, of the forms evangelistic, whose four gospels, streams majestic, irrigate the church of God. Matthew first, and Mark the second, Luke with these is rightly reckoned, and the loved apostle beckoned to the shore his master trod. Matthew's form the man supplieth, for that thus he testifieth, of the Lord that none denieth, him to spring from man he made, Luke's the ox in figure special, as a creature sacrificial, for that he the rites judicial of Mosaic law displayed. Mark the wilds as lion shaketh, and the desert hearing quaketh, preparation while he maketh, that the heart with God be right, John loves double wing devising, footnote, that is, of love to God, and love to his neighbour. End footnote. Earth on eagle plumes despising, to his God and Lord uprising, soars away in purer light. Symbols quadriform uniting, they of Christ are thus indicting, quadriform his acts which writing they produce before our eyes. Man, whose birth man's law obeyeth, ox, whom victim's passion slayeth, lion, when on death he prayeth, eagle, soaring to the skies. These the creature forms ethereal, round the majesty imperial, seen by prophets, but material, difference twixt the vision springs, wheels are rolling, wings are flying, scripture law this signifying, step with step, as wheels complying, contemplation by the wings. Footnote. The poet compares the visions of Ezekiel and St. John. The wheels of the prophet, which roll along the earth, signify the account given by the evangelists of the earthly life of our Lord. The wings of the apostle set forth their knowledge of his eternal deity. And again, as four wheels must necessarily keep time together, so there is the most perfect concord between the narrations of the evangelists. End footnote. Paradise is satiated, blossoms, thrives, is fecundated, with the waters irrigated from these streams that I proceed, Christ the fountain, they the river, Christ the source, and they the giver of the streams that they deliver to supply his people's need. Footnote. The river that was parted and became into four heads is explained of Christ, the various acts of whose life on earth are divided between the four evangelists. Medieval symbolism, 
represent St. Matthew by Gihon, St. Mark by Tigris, St. Luke by Euphrates, and St. John by Pison. End footnote. In these streams our souls bedewing, that more fully we ensuing, thirst of goodness and renewing, thirst more fully may allay, we their holy doctrine follow, from the gulf that gapes to swallow, and from pleasures vain and hollow, to the joys of heavenly day. End of section 19「Section 20 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. A.K.A. D.A.'s Celebris. Adam of St. Victor. This is another prose of Adam of St. Victor, composed for Easter. Hail the much-remembered day, night from morning flies away, life the chains of death hath burst, gladness, welcome, grief begone, greater glory draweth on than confusion at the first. Flies the shadowy from the true, flies the ancient from the new, comfort hath each tear dispersed. Hail our Pascha, that wast dead, what proceeded in the head, that each member hopes to gain, Christ, our newer Pascha, now, late in death content to bow, when the spotless lamb was slain. Christ the prey hath here unbound, from the foe that girt us round, which in Samson's deed is found, when the lion he had slain, David in his father's cause, from the lion's hungry jaws, and the bear's devouring paws, hath set free his flock again. Footnote. This allusion is not very clear. There seems to be a reference to Saul in the wilderness of Maon, when, having compassed David and his men round, he was only prevented from destroying them by the intelligence that the Philistines had invaded the land. The thought of the Philistines introduces the great destroyer of the Philistines, Samson. End footnote. Footnote. The victory of Samson over the lion is spiritualized in an infinity of ways. Samson overcame him without telling his father and his mother. From the eater came forth meat, as from death came forth life, or otherwise, as from the death of the lion of the tribe of Judah came forth the spiritual honey which satisfies his people. End footnote. He that thousands slew by dying, Samson, Christ is typifying, who by death o'ercame his foes, Samson, by interpretation, is their sunlight, our salvation, thus hath brought illumination to the elect on whom he rose. Footnote. As the dead which Samson slew in his death were more than they whom he slew in his life, so not till after our Lord's death did the thousands of converts fall to the church. Samson, according to the ungrammatical interpretation of the fathers, means their son, that is, the son of those that belong to him. Thus Christ, though the son of all, yet shall bring final salvation to the elect alone. End footnote. From the cross's pole of glory flows the must of ancient story. In the church's wine vat stored, from the press now trodden duly, Gentile first fruits gathered newly, drink the precious liquor poured. Footnote. The reference is to the pole on which the two spies carried the bunch of grapes. The pole is the cross. The bunch typifies the Lord as the true vine. The spies, the Jews and Gentiles, respectively. The spy that went first turned his back on the bunch. Thus the Jews first called, rejected our Lord. He that came last kept his eyes on it. Thus the Gentiles, though last called, accepted the offered salvation. End footnote. Sackcloth worn with foul abuses passes on to royal uses. Grace in that garb at length we see, 
the flesh hath conquered misery. They, by whom their monarch perished, lost the kingdom that they cherished. And, for a sign and wonder, Cain is set, who never shall be slain. Footnote the poet refers partly to the psalm, Thou hast put off my sackcloth, and girded me with gladness, partly to the story of the Gibeonites, by means of whose old sacks, when received by the princes, their salvation was effected. The sackcloth is here the flesh of Christ, and the royal uses its immortality of glory after his death. End footnote. Footnote. The Vulgate is here followed, the Lord set Cain for a sign. End footnote. Reprobated and rejected was this stone that, now elected, for a trophy stands erected, and a precious cornerstone. Sin's not nature's termination. He creates a new creation, and himself their colligation binds two peoples into one. Give we glory to the head, or the member's love be shed. End of section 20. Section 21 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Zyma Vetus Expurgatur, Adam of St. Victor. Another Easter sequence of Adam of St. Victor. Purge we out the ancient leaven, that the feast of earth and heaven we may celebrate aright. On today our hope stands founded, Moses teacheth how unbounded is its virtue and its might. This day Egypt's treasures spoiled, and the Hebrews freed that toiled, pressed with bondage and in chains, from the mortar, brick and stubble, heaviest toil and sorest trouble, had they known in Zoan's plains. Now the voice of exultation, now the triumph of salvation, free and wide its tidings flings. This is the day the Lord hath made, the day that bids our sin and sorrow flee away, Life and light and health he brings. In the law the types lay shaded, In the promised end they faded, Christ who all things consummates, Christ whose blood aside hath turned, That devouring sword which burned, Waving wide at Eden's gates. Yea, that child, our mystic laughter, For whose sake the ram fell after, Signifies the joy of life, Joseph from the prison goeth, Christ by resurrection showeth, he hath conquered in the strife. Footnote St. Hildebert, following the fathers, Isaac, whose name by interpretation is laughter, signifies Christ, for Christ is the joy of man and angels. End footnote he, the dragon, that devouring, Pharaoh's dragons, rose o'erpowering, all their malice and their might, he, the serpent, set on high, that the people might not die from the fiery serpent's bite. Footnote So St. Hildebert again, this rod, thrown down on the earth and become a serpent, devoured the rods of the Egyptian magicians, because the Son of God made flesh after the dignity of his glory, made obedient unto death, by the very means of the death of the flesh, deprived the serpent of his deadly venom, and destroyed death and the sting of death, according to that saying, O death, I will be thy death, O hell, I will be thy plagues. End footnote. He the hook that hid a while, pierced Leviathan with guile, he the child that laid his hand on the cockatrice's den, that the ancient lord of men might avoid the ransomed land. Footnote. The reference is to the question put by God to Job, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? But what man was unable to do, that Christ could, and did effect on the true Leviathan, Satan? Thus, according to the fathers, 
Our Lord's humanity was the bait, his divinity the hook. Satan, unconsciously swallowing one, was destroyed by the other. Thus, in an Ambrosian hymn, What more sublime can be than this, That very sin should end in bliss, That perfect love should cast out fear, And better life from death appear? Death should the hook devour amain, And self in self made knots enchain, The life of all men should be slain, That all men's life might rise again? So St. Hildebert, in his epigrams, if we may so call them, named the moral interpretation of Scripture. Fisher the father is, this world the sea, Christ's flesh the bait, the hook his deity, the line his generation, Satan took the offered bait and perished by the hook. End footnote. Footnote. The poet refers to the medieval interpretation of Isaiah's prophecy, The weaned child shall lay his hand on the cockatrice's den. End footnote. They who scorn the seer offended, as to Bethel he ascended, feel the bald head's wrath and flee, David after madness feigned, scapegoat now no more detained, ritual sparrow all go free. Footnote. According to the medieval explanation, Elisha, going up to Bethel, was a type of the pilgrimage of Christ on the cross of the true house of God, and the bald head of the prophet typified the Saviour's crown of thorns. The mocking children represented the taunting Jews, and as there came two she-bears out of the wood, and tear forty and two children of the former, so, after forty-two years, the two savage conquerors, Vespasian and Titus, destroyed Jerusalem. End footnote. Footnote. David's assumed madness in the court of Achish is here regarded as a symbol of the madness imputed by the Jews to our Lord. Many of them said, He hath a devil, and he is mad. Why hear ye him? End footnote. Alien wedlock first despising, with a jawbone, Samson rising, thousand Philistines hath slain. Then, in Gaza as he tarried, forth her brazen gates he carried, to the mountain from the plain. Sleeping first the sleep of mortals, Judah's lion thus the portals of the grave hath borne away, while the father's voice resounded, he, with majesty unbounded, sought our mother's courts of day. Footnote a reference to the medieval belief that the whelps of the lion are born dead and continue so for three days when their father arouses them by roaring, as we saw in the hymn of St. Fulbert of Chartres. End footnote. Jonah, by the tempest followed, whom the whale of old time swallowed, type of our true Jonah giving, three days past is rendered living, from that dark and narrow space, now the myrrh of Cyprus groweth, widelier spreadeth, sweetlier bloweth, law its withered blossoms throweth, that the church may take their place. Footnote. Canticles 1.14 My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphire in the vineyard of Engedi, or as the Vulgate reads, a cluster of Cyprus. In the preceding verse, the church says, A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. The myrrh is interpreted as our Lord's death, the wine of his resurrection. Thus, Marbodus of Wren, in his metrical explanation of the Song of Solomon, Who, dying, caused my heart one hour of deepest gloom, Is wine of royal cheer, arisen from the tomb. End footnote. Death and life have striven newly, Jesus Christ hath risen truly, And with Christ ascended duly, Many a witness that he lives. Dawn of newness, happy morrow, Wipes away our eve of sorrow, Since from death our life we borrow, Brightest joy the season gives. Jesu, victor, life and head, Jesu, way thy people tread, by thy death from death released, call us to the paschal feast, that with boldness we may come, living water, 
bread undying, vine each branch with life supplying, thou must cleanse us, thou must feed us, from the second death must lead us upward to our heavenly home. End of section 21「Section 22 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal Laud Crucius Atolemus, Adam of St. Victor. This sequence, for the invention or exaltation of the cross, is perhaps a masterpiece of Adam of S. Victor. Be the cross our theme and story. We who in the cross's glory shall exult forevermore. By the cross the warrior rises, by the cross the foe despises, till he gains the heavenly shore. Heavenward raise songs and praise, save from loss by the cross. Give the cross his honor due, life and voice keep well in chorus, then the melody sonorous shall make concord good and true love be warm and praise be fervent thou that art the cross's servant and in that hast rest from strife every kindred every nation hail the tree that brings salvation tree of beauty tree of life oh how glorious how transcendent was this altar how resplendent in the lifeblood of the lamb of the lamb immaculate that redeemed our ancient state from its sin and from its shame footnote so we have seen fortunatus address the cross hail altar hail o victim thee dex now thy passion's victory the author of the glorious Ambrosian hymn, Ad Canem Angi Providi, still more boldly, whose body hath redeemeth our loss, roast on the altar of the cross, which image is omitted in the Roman recast, Ad Regius Agni Daps, so also Santolius Victorinus, Ara sub ilia par dio. Si conservat victimiam. And Adam himself repeats the thought in his second sequence on the evangelist. Era crucius man suetus. Sic officure sic vitus. Transit observantia. So also S. Hildebert. He, on the altar of the cross, made good the office both of king and priest, of king because he fought and conquered, of priest because he made oblation and appeased. But neither was the oblation which he made, nor the God to whom he offered alien from himself. And footnote. This the latter Jacob saw, whereby all things Christ shall draw, to himself both friends and foes, who its nature hath expended, in its limits comprehended, all the world's four quarters knows. Footnote. So Hildebert, Christ therefore will to be exalted on the cross nor without a reason, but that, in accordance with the four arms of the cross, whereby the four parts of the world be signified, he might draw all men to love, 
to imitate and to reign together with him. End footnote. No new sacraments we mention. We devise no fresh invention. This religion was of old. Wood made sweet the bitter current. Wood called forth the rushing torrent from the smitten rock that rolled. Footnote. The reference is, of course, to the bitter waters of Mara. Daniel unaccountably applies it to the healing the waters of Jericho by Elisha. And footnote. No salvation for the mansion. Wear the cross in meat expansion. On the doorpost stood, not graved. Where it stood, the midnight blast of the avenging angel passed, and the firstborn child was saved. Would the widow's hands collected, when salvation unexpected, came the prophet's mystic boon, where the wood of faith is wanted. There the spirit's oil is scanted, and the meal is wasted soon. Footnote. The two sticks which the widow of Sarapa was gathering when salvation came to her house are expounded of the two bars which by their intersection make up the cross. And footnote. Rome beheld each armed vessel and Maxentius vainly wrestle. In the deep against its might, this procured the bright ovation. O'er the Persian and the Thracian, when Heraclius won the fight. Types of old in scripture hidden, setting forth the cross are bidden. In these days to fuller light, kings are flying, foes are dying, on the cross of Christ relying, one a thousand puts to flight. Footnote, a very clear reference to the Crusades. The two last stanzas are slightly altered from the translation which Mr. Wack Barth has given of them. As a separate poem, the Ista Sus Fortiors is quoted by Archbishop Harsonet in a sermon preached at Paul's cross and footnote. This its votary still assureth, victory evermore secureth, weakness and diseases cureth, triumphs o'er the powers of hell, Satan's captives liberateth, life in sinners renovateth, all in glory reign stateth, who by ancient Adam fell. Tree, triumphal might, possessing, earth salvation, crown and blessing, every other praetor gressing, both in bloom and bud and flower, medicine of the Christian spirit, save the just, give sinners merit, who does might for deeds inherit, overpassing human power. End of section 22. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 23 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal Quam Delecta Tabernacula, Adam of St. Victor A prose of Adam of S. Victor for the dedication of a church. How lovely and how loved, how full of grace. O Lord, Thou, God of hosts, Thy dwelling place, How elect each architect, 
how serene its walls remain, never moved by, rather proved by, wind and storm and surge and rain. Oh, how glorious those foundations, which in ancient generations, types and shadows half display, from the side of Adam sleeping, Eve proceeded, figure keeping, of a band to last for a footnote. The poet here, after his manner, heaps together the Old Testament types of the church. The first of these is Eve, as she was formed from the side of her husband while he slept. The spotless bride was formed from the side of Christ while he slept in death on the cross. For it was when the spear pierced his side that the sacraments of the church flowed forth. And footnote. Framed of wood, the ark effected, Noah's salvation well directed, through the deluge and upheld, called the promise to inherit. Sarah laughs with joy of spirit, or the infant of her eld. Footnote. Heidbert, in one of his poems, thus expands the type. The verses lose nothing by being put into prose. The ark of Noah was narrow at the top, broad at the bottom, and finished about in a cubit. The beasts were placed lowest, then the men, and the birds above them. The ark figures the church. Many there are in this who seem irrational as beasts, and thence the width of the lower stage. There are fewer in it who may properly be called men, as knowing the things that belong to their peace and avoiding sin. Hence the comparative narrowness of the upper stage. There are fewer still who, like birds, condemn earthly things and rise to heaven, whence they are fitly represented as at the top, and they are finished about in a cubit. For Christ is set forth by the cubit, and beyond him the church seeks and finds nothing. End footnote. From her picture, Bethuel's daughter, giveth Elizer water, and the camels slake their thirst, for her bridegroom she prepareth. While the rings and chains she weareth, that himself had sent her first. Footnote. According to the medieval allegory, Isaac is Christ, Rebecca, the Gentile church, Eliza, the apostles and doctors, whom he sent to betroth that church to himself. The servants' thirst, their ardor for souls, satisfied by the obedience of the Gentile converts, as Eliza's by the picture of Rebecca, and footnote, letter held by spirit scanted, saw the synagogue supplanted, wandering wide by Jacob's hand, Leah's tender vision fleeth, much that clear-eyed Rachel seeth, wedded thence in equal band. Footnote: Esau here represents the Jews who, while wandering in seeking for the letter of the scriptures and careless about the spirit, lost the blessing which Jacob obtained. Leah and Rachel, as we have already seen, are usually taken as types of the active and contemplative life, but they also stand for the Jewish economy and the church. Leah tender-eyed, i.e. blear-eyed, represents the former, unable to see the antitype in the type. Rachel, according to the strange 
etymology of Hildebert signifies that sees the beginning, i.e., Christ. Hence, she is called seeing Rachel by our poet, and therefore typifies the church who sees her Lord in the mysteries of the Old Testament. End footnote. By the wayside as she fareth, Tamar twins to Judah beareth. After many a widowed day, Here, the royal maid revealing, What the rush ark was concealing, Beareth Moses safe away. Footnote. Tamar is the Gentile church, The garment in which she sat by the wayside, Confession of sins, her becoming the mother of twins by Judah, while ignorant who she was, is explained of that text, A people whom I have not known shall serve me. Here, that is, here in the church, those things really take place, which in scripture history are allegorically set forth. The Nile is the world because it flows through Egypt, the land of darkness. Moses is the natural state of man. The ark, his vain endeavor to work out a righteousness of his own. Pharaoh's daughter, the grace of God, which finally makes him by adoption a son of the true king. The three next allusions are perfectly clear. End footnote. Here the Lamb is immolated, whereby Israel may be sated, sprinkled with the atoning blood. Here we pass the Red Sea surges, while the rising billow urges Egypt's host beneath the flood. Here the urn of manna standeth, here the tables God commandeth. In the ark of covenant rest. Here the ornaments of beauty. Here the robes of priestly duty. Chief of all the fair long vest. Here the Hittite warrior perished. Bathsheba is dearly cherished. And made partner of the throne. Here in raiment wrought and golden. By the king is she beholden, as a royal princess known. Footnote. Uriah sets forth the Jews, Bathsheba, the true church. David represents Christ. Uriah would not go into his house, nor the Jews enter into the house of wisdom. Uriah by carefully keeping the letters with which he was entrusted, perished. The Jews, as we have just been reminded, by clinging too closely to the letter of Scripture, were also lost. And Christ took the church from them and wedded her to himself. End footnote. Hither Sheba's queen proceeded, by the love of wisdom speeded. As to Solomon she bowed, black but calmly she ascendeth. As when myrrh with incense blendeth in a dark and fragrant cloud. She whose glory ancient story shadowed faintly bright and saintly opens here the day of grace now on our beloved breast. Sing we of him. As we rest, for the nuptial comes apace. The feast at whose beginning blend, The louder notes that trumpets send, While gentler psalteries hail the end, Ten thousand thousand choirs on high, The bridegroom in one melody, Exulting sing eternally, Alleluia! Amen. Footnote. According to the usual medieval allegory, as for instance explained by Honorus of 
Otan on the 80th Psalm, the trumpets so usually employed in the Jewish feasts are the harsher law, the sweeter, sultry, the gentler teaching of the gospel. End footnote. End of section 23. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 24 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. In Hawk Annie Circulo, apparently of the 12th century. The following Christmas carol is of German origin and has had at least two popular translations in that language. The earliest begins in De Jar Zer Kliket. I have omitted three stanzas as being merely repetitions of the others. In the ending of the year, light and life to man appear, and the holy babe is here by the Virgin Mary. For the word becometh flesh by the Virgin Mary. What in ancient days was slain, this day calls to life again. God is coming here to reign by the Virgin Mary. For the word becometh flesh by the Virgin Mary. Adam ate the fruit and died, but the curse that did be tied, all his sons is turned aside by the Virgin Mary. For the word becometh flesh by the Virgin Mary. No shut the ark of old, when the flood came, as is told. Us its doors today enfold, and note by the Virgin Mary. For the word becometh flesh by the Virgin Mary. Every creature of the plain own the guiltful serpent's reign. He this happy day is slain by the Virgin Mary. For the word becometh flesh by the Virgin Mary. Twas the star the sun that bore. Footnote. The poet is imitating S. Bernard. See page 49. And footnote. Which salvation should restore. But pollution ne'er the more. Touch the Virgin Mary. For the word becometh flesh. By the Virgin Mary. And they circumcise the Lord, and his blood for us is poured. Thus salvation is restored by the Virgin Mary. For the word becometh flesh by the Virgin Mary. In a manger is he laid, ox and ass their worship paid. Over him her veil is spread by the Virgin Mary, for the word becometh flesh by the Virgin Mary, and the heavenly angel's tongue, glory in the highest sung, and the shepherds o'er him hung with the Virgin Mary, for the word becometh flesh by the Virgin Mary. Joseph watches o'er his rest. Cold and sorrow him infest. He and hungered seeks the breast of the Virgin Mary. For the word becometh flesh by the Virgin Mary. Wherefore let our choir today banish sorrow far away, singing and exalting a with the Virgin Mary. For the word becometh flesh by the
the Virgin Mary. End note. On this same subject, the following lines of S. Heldebert, which are a good specimen of his rudeness and epigrammatic terseness, deserve translation. Two sons appear to man today, one made, one maker, one eternal, one to fade, one the star's king, the king of their king, one. This makes, that bids him make, the hours to run. The sun shines with the true sun, ray with ray, light with light, day with him that makes the day. Day without night, without seed, bears she fruit, unwedded mother, flower without a root. She then all greater, he the greatest still. She filled by him whose glories all things fill. That night is almost day and yields to none. Wherein God flesh, wherein flesh God put on. The undone is done again, attuned the jar. Sun precedes day, the morn. The morning star, true sun, and very light, and very day. God was that sun, and God is light and ray. How bear the virgin, ask thou, God and man? I know not, but I know God all things can. The reader can hardly fail to be reminded of Dr. Don in these compositions of Hildbert. The reference in the first line is to the increased length of the days from Christmas, to which the ecclesiastical poets constantly refer. So prudentious, quid est quod archium circulum, sol gem recurrence discreet, Christ Asen terris nasitur, qui lucis auget tramitum. So S. Peter Christologus, the days begin to lengthen, because Christ, the true day, hath arisen. S. Knocker, also, or one of his followers, in a Christmas sequence, this the present shining day testifies, increased in its length, because the true sun, born on earth, hath with the ray of its light dispersed the darkness. End, end note. End of section 24. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 25 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. O Philly a Philae, apparently of the twelfth century. The eight following hymns, the authors of which are unknown, explain themselves. They may all be referred to about the same date, namely the thirteenth century. The first has more than once been translated but it seemed to me that its rude simplicity might perhaps be more successfully caught by another effort. It is scarcely possible for anyone not acquainted with the melody to imagine the jubilant effect of the triumphant Alleluia attached to apparently less important circumstances of the resurrection, e.g., 
S. Peters being outstripped by S. John. It seems to speak of the majesty of that event, the smallest portions of which are worthy to be chronicled. I have here and there borrowed a line from preceding translations. Alleluia, 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 ye sons and daughters of the King, whom heavenly hosts in glory sing. Today the grave hath lost its sting. Alleluia. On that first morning of the week, before the day began to break, they went their buried Lord to seek. Alleluia. Both Mary as it came to pass, and Mary Magdalene it was, and Mary wife of Cleopas. Alleluia. An angel clad in white was he, that sate and spake unto the three, Your Lord is gone to Galilee. Alleluia. When John the Apostle heard the fame, he to the tomb with Peter came, but in the way outran the same. Alleluia. That night the apostles met in fear, amidst them came their Lord most dear and said, Peace be unto all here. Alleluia. When Didymus had after heard that Jesus had fulfilled his word, he doubted if it were the Lord. Alleluia. Thomas, behold my side, saith he, my hands, my feet, my body see, and doubt not, but believe in me. Alleluia. No longer Thomas then denied. He saw the hands, the feet, the side. Thou art my Lord and God, he cried. Alleluia. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet whose faith hath constant been. In life eternal they shall reign. Alleluia. On this most holy day of days, be laud and jubilee and praise to God both hearts and voices raise. Alleluia. And we with holy church unite as is both meet and just and right in glory to the King of light. Alleluia. End of section 25. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 26 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Surrexit Christus Hodie, apparently of the 12th century. Today the victor or his foes for human consolation rose. Alleluia! Who two days since through torments ran to succor miserable man. Alleluia! The holy woman to the tomb with gifts of precious ointment come. Alleluia! And Christ the Lord they seek with pain for our transgressions who was slain. Alleluia! An angel clad in white appears to bring glad tidings to their ears. Alleluia! Fear not, O trembling ones, saith he, but go your ways to Galilee. Alleluia! Make speed and tell the apostles this, that he is risen, the Lord of bliss. Alleluia! To Peter then the King of heaven appeared, and after to the eleven. Alleluia! In this our paschal joy we raise, unto the Lord our songs of praise. Alleluia! To God on high all praise give we, the ever-blessed Trinity. Alleluia! End of section 26
Section 27 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal Finita Yam Sunt Proelia Apparently from the 12th century Hallelujah, hallelujah, finished is the battle now. The crown is on the victor's brow. Hence with sadness sing with gladness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, after sharp death that him befell, Jesus Christ hath harrowed hell. Earth is singing, heaven is ringing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. On the third morning he arose, Bright with victory o'er his foes, Sing we lauding and applauding, Hallelujah! Hallelujah, hallelujah! He hath closed hell's brazen door, And heaven is open evermore, Hence with sadness sing with gladness, Hallelujah! Hallelujah, hallelujah! Lord, by thy wounds we call on thee, so from ill death to set us free, that our living be thanksgiving. Hallelujah. End of section 27。section 28 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Jan Pulsa Cadunt Nubilia. Apparently from the 12th century. The cloud of night is passed away. Mary rejoice, rejoice today. Hallelujah! He that abhorred not thy womb hath risen victorious from the tomb. Hallelujah! The dart of death is napped in twain. At Jesus' feet death's self lies slain. Hallelujah! In consolation our annoy, our sorrow hath his end in joy. Hallelujah! The face with spitting marred so late Is glorious now as heaven's own gate. Hallelujah! Graved in his hands and feet the wounds Are rivers whence all grace abounds. Hallelujah! Thy transverse arms, O cross, are now The sceptre whereto all things bow. Hallelujah! End of section 28。section 29 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Veni, Veni, Emmanuel, apparently of the twelfth century. This Advent hymn is little more than a versification of some of the Christmas antiphons commonly called the O's. Draw nigh, draw nigh, Emmanuel, and loose thy captive Israel, that mourns in lonely exile here. Until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, Is born for thee, O Israel. O rod of Jesse's stem, arise, And free us from our enemies, And set us loose from Satan's chains, And from the pits with all its pains. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, is born for thee, O Israel. Thou, the true East, draw nigh, draw nigh, to give us comfort from on high, and drive away the shades of night, and pierce the clouds, and bring us light. 
Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, is born for thee, O Israel. Key of the house of David, come, reopen thou our heavenly home, make safe the way that we must go, and close the path that leads below. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, is born for thee, O Israel. Ruler and Lord, draw nigh, draw nigh, who to thy flock in Sinai didst give of ancient times thy law, in cloud and majesty and awe. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, is born for thee, O Israel. End of section 29section thirty of medieval hymns and sequences this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org medieval hymns and sequences by john mason neal chelos ascendit hodie apparently of the twelfth century Today above the sky he soared. Alleluia! The King of glory, Christ the Lord. Alleluia! He sitteth on the Father's hand. Alleluia! And ruleth sky and sea and land. Alleluia! Now all things have their end foretold. Alleluia! In holy David's song of old. Alleluia! My Lord is seated with the Lord, Alleluia, upon the throne of God adored, Alleluia. In this great triumph of our King, Alleluia, to God on high all praise we bring, Alleluia. To Him all thanks and Lord give we, Alleluia, the ever-blessed Trinity, Alleluia. End of section 30。section 31 of medieval hymns and sequences。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. E.C. Campus A. Vernal, 13th Century. Footnote. In Du Merrill's copy, three lines precede this, but as they disturb the meter where they stand, and are presently repeated in other words, I take them to be merely a various reading of the third, fourth, and fifth in the Finnish poem. End footnote. An Easter sequence published by Du Merrill from a manuscript of the 13th century. The poet borrows one line from the Pang Lingus of Fortunatus, and seems in another place to copy Adam of S. Victor. The meter is very rare. Spring returns with jubilation, when the tree of our salvation, chiefest of the forest nation, wrought the work of reparation, fallen man redeeming. Through Judea's rage infernal, from the nut breaks forth the kernel. Footnote. Thus Adam of S. Victor compares our Lord's humanity to the shell, his divinity to the kernel. Christ the nut, the skin surrounding, passion's bitterness expounding, and the shell, his human frame. But in flesh lay hid the eternal, and his sweetness and the kernel rightly signifies the same. 
and footnote. Hangs upon the cross the eternal, trumples earth the sun supernal, hides in shades its beaming. Accusation, condemnation, pillar, thongs, and flagellation, gall and bitter coronation. This he bore and reprobation, railing and blaspheming. Jewish people crucify him, torture, scourge, and mock, and try him. In that precious blood bedye him, that our race is ransomed by him. Oh, how little deeming, theme of Israelite rejection, now with joyful recollection, Christians hail the resurrection. With good deeds and heart's affection to the victor teeming. End of section 31. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Section 32 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Adoro to Devote. Latin's Dietus. St. Thomas Aquinas died 1274. The following hymn of S. Thomas Aquinas to the Holy Eucharist was never in public use in the medieval church, but it has been appended as a private devotion to most missals. It is worthy of notice how the angelic doctor, as if afraid to employ any pomp of words on approaching so tremendous a mystery, has used the very simplest expressions throughout. Humbly I adore thee, hidden deity, which beneath these figures art concealed from me. Holy in submission thee my spirit hails, for in contemplating thee it wholly fails. Taste and touch and vision in thee are deceived. But the hearing only may be well believed. I believe whatever God's own Son declared. Nothing can be truer than truth's very word. On the cross lay hidden but thy deity. Here is also hidden thy humanity. But in both believing and confessing, Lord, ask I what? The dying thief of thee implored. Though thy wounds, like Thomas, I behold not now, Thee my Lord confessing, and my God I bow. Give me ever stronger faith in thee above, Give me ever stronger hope and stronger love. O most sweet memorial of his death and woe, Living bread, which giveth life to man below. Let my spirit ever eat of thee and live, And the blessed fruition of thy sweetness give. Pelican of mercy, Jesu, Lord and God, Cleanse me, wretched sinner, in thy precious blood. Blood whereof, one drop for humankind outpoured, might from all transgression have the world restored. Jesu, whom thus veiled I must see below, when shall that be given which I long for so, that at last beholding thy uncovered face, though wittest satisfy me with thy fullest grace? End of section 32
Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 33 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Pange Lingua Gloriosi, St. Thomas Aquinas. Pange Lingua Gloriosi. Footnote. This hymn contests the second place among those of the Western Church, with the Vexilla Regis, the Stabat Mater, the Jesu Dulcis Memoria, the Ad Regis Agni Dapis, the Ad Supernum, and one or two others, leaving the Dies Ire in its unapproachable glory. It has been a bow of Ulysses to translators. The translation above given claims no other merit than an attempt to unite the best portions of the four best translations with which I am acquainted, Mr. Walkerbarth's, Dr. Pusey's, and that of Leeds' book, and Mr. Caswell's, which last, however, omits the double rhymes. Chiefly where, as in the first line and the fourth and eighth verses, all seem to me to fail, I have ventured another attempt, possibly to display another failure. In the letter, the two concluding lines, Prestit fide supplementum sensum defectui, are avoided by all. The versions are, Faith the senses dark refining mysteries to comprehend. Faith thine earnest adoration passing eye and touch present. Mr. Caswell's translation, unshackled by rhyme, is nearest. Faith for all defects supplying where the feeble senses fail. The great crux of the translator is the fourth verse. I give all the translations. 1. God the word by one word maketh very bread his flesh to be, and whoso that cup partaketh tastes the fount of cavalry, while the carnal mind forsaketh, faith receives the mystery. Here, the incarnation of the word, so necessary to the antithesis, is omitted. And so exact a writer as St. Thomas would never have used the expression by one word. 2. At the incarnate word's high bidding, very bread to flesh doth turn. Wine becometh Christ's blood shedding. And if sense cannot discern, guileless spirits never dreading may from faith sufficient learn. Here, the antithesis is utterly lost by the substitution of incarnate for made flesh and bidding for word. 3. Word made flesh, the bread of nature, thou by word to flesh dost turn, wine to blood of our creator. If no sense the work discern, yet the true heart proves no traitor, faith unaided all shall learn. Here, the antithesis is preserved, though at the expense of the vocative case. And surely St. Thomas, in an exact dogmatical poem, would not have spoken of the blood of our Creator. Mr. Caswell, following up the hint given by the last version, and substituting the apposite pronoun for the vocative, has given, as from his freedom of rhyme might be expected, the best version. Word made flesh, the bread of nature, by a word to flesh he turns. Wine into his blood he changes. What though sense no change discerns, Only be the heart in earnest, Faith the lesson quickly learns. In both these last translations, however, The panem verum of St. Thomas is not given, And Mr. Caswell brings in the worse than unnecessary article By a word. I am well aware that my own attempt is far from perfect, But I think that these points are satisfied in it. End of footnote. Of the glorious body telling, O my tongue, its mystery sing, And the blood all price excelling, Which for this world's ransoming, In a generous womb once dwelling, He shed forth the Gentile's king. Given for us, for us descending, Of a virgin to proceed, Man with man, in converse blending, Scattered he the gospel seed, Till his sojourn drew to ending, which he closed in wondrous deed. At the last great supper seated, circled by his brethren's band, 
all the law required completed, in the meat its statutes planned, to the twelve himself he meted, for their food with his own hand, word made flesh, by word he truly makes true bread his flesh to be. Wine Christ's blood becometh newly, and if senses fail to see, faith alone the true heart duly strengthens for the mystery. Such a sacrament inclining, worship we with reverent awe, ancient rites their place resigning to a new and nobler law, faith her supplement assigning to make good the senses flaw, honor, laud, and praise addressing, to the Father and the Son, might ascribe we virtue, blessing, and eternal benison. Holy Ghost from both progressing, equal laud to thee be done. End of section 33。section 34 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Alleluia, Dulce Carmen, 13th Century. The Latin Church, as it is well known, forbade, as a general rule, the use of Alleluia in Septuagesima. Hence, in more than one ritual, its frequent repetition on the Saturday before Septuagesima, as if by way of farewell to its employment. This custom was enjoined in the German diocese by the Council of A. La Chapelle in 817, but various reasons render it probable that the following hymn is not of earlier date than the 13th century. Alleluia, song of sweetness, voice of joy, celestial lay. Alleluia is the glory of the choirs in heavenly day, which the angels sing, abiding in the house of God for a. Alleluia, joyful mother of the blessed Jerusalem. Alleluia is the anthem that full well befitteth them. While to sadness babbles rivers, exiles on the earth condemn. Alleluia, we deserve not, here to chant forevermore. Alleluia, our transgressions, make us for a while give o'er. For the holy time is coming, that would have a sin deplore. Wherefore supplicate we, lauding thee, O blessed Trinity, we at last may keep our Easter in thy home beyond the sky. There to thee, our Alleluia, singing everlastingly. End of section 34. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 35 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. These a Letitia, thirteenth century. A German carol, at least it does not seem to have been used in the offices of the church. It is perhaps scarcely worth mentioning that Luther believed it inspired. Royal day that chaseth gloom, day by gladness, speeded 
though beheldest from Mary's womb, how the king proceeded, whom true man with praise our choir, hails and love and heart's desire, joy and admiration, who true God enthroned in light, passeth wonder, passeth sight, passeth cogitation. On the virgin as he hung, God, the world's creator, like a rose from lily sprung, stood astounded nature, that a maiden's arms enfold, him that made the world of old, him that ever liveth, that a maiden's spotless breast, to the king eternal rest, warmth and nurture giveth, as a sunbeam through the glass, passeth, but not staineth. Thus the virgin, as she was, virgin still remaineth. Blessed mother, in whose womb, lay the light that exiles gloom. God, the Lord of ages, blessed maid, from whom the Lord, her own infant, God adored. Hungers, pains, assages. End of section 35. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 36 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Sedent Justi Signa Luctus, 14th Century. This Easter hymn, which seems of French origin, must from its subjective character and the occurrence of one or two terms scarcely known to medieval writers, be classed with the preceding. Hence with sorrow and with sighing, waves are calming, storms are flying. Moses hath passed through the sea, Israel's captive band is free. Life by death slew death and saved us. In his blood the Lamb hath laved us, clothing us with victory. Alleluia. Hark the deep abysses thunder. Hark the chains are napped in sunder. And the unfettered fathers rise, soaring towards the opened skies. God and men our ransom paying, and in light himself arraying, claimeth now the victory. Alleluia! Jesus Christ from death hath risen, t'was his Godhead burst the prison, t'was his blessed humanity struggled through our misery. God's long patience, God's rejection, Brought to pass our resurrection. Brought to pass our victory. Alleluia. This the law the Savior teaches. This the call his triumph preaches. Sinner from the grave of sin. Rise eternal joy to win. From the death our sins decreed us. Jesus Christ by death hath freed us. Sing we then his victory. Alleluia. Vain is Hades indignation. Shines the sun of our salvation. Christ's dear children are set free. Crushed is Satan's slavery. Now the net is rent in pieces. Now our woe in triumph ceases. Rise we to our victory. Alleluia! Wherefore, O ye ransomed number, shake ye off 
your ghostly slumber. Be ye children of the day. Tread in your Redeemer's way. If our Savior's help be nigh us, Satan vainly shall defy us. Ours shall be the victory. Alleluia. End of section 36. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 37 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Novi Partis Gaudium. This sequence, for such it appears, was first published by Dumeril from a manuscript of the 14th century. The writer was clearly formed in the school of Adam of S. Victor. The meter is very uncommon and perhaps not very pleasing. Let the faithful raise the lay to the newborn king today that the light of light would come from the virgin's holy womb, purging Adam's guilt away, shedding joy and scattering gloom. Long had darkness reigned around, light and freedom none were found, hope of exit none in ken, for the fallen tribes of men, whom the prince of this world bound, fast within his doleful den. From the dungeon and the cave, had the law no power to save, while the wounded traveler lay, breathing of his soul away. There the priest no aidance gave, word of hope, had none to say. Footnote. The poet, whether by design or not, misses the usual interpretation of the fathers, that by the priest was meant the patriarchal dispensation, which passed by on the other side, neither doing nor professing to do anything for the salvation of man while by the Levite, who came and looked on, the traveler, the law was typified, which indeed showed man his sinfulness, but gave no effectual help. End footnote. So the Levite, passing by, on him cast an idle eye. For the law that sin displayed showed its stain, but gave no aid, till to succor she drew nigh, grace with mightier powers arrayed. Prophet's staff was sent before, but the child was near the moor, raised to life until he came, who had sent afore the same, God and man whom Mary bore, Taking of an infant frame. Footnote. The allusion is, of course, to the staff of Elisha. Our Lord's taking the form of a child is here considered as symbolized by the prophet stretching himself upon the dead son of the Shunammite and thus, so to speak, taking his form before raising him to life. End footnote. End of section 37. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 38 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Omnis Fidelis Gadiat. The following hymn from the Mycen Breviary was appropriated to the Feast of the Face of Our Savior, celebrated on January the 15th. This was one of the festivals which, however well suited to the simplicity of the Middle Ages, have been, it cannot be denied, wisely allowed to drop from the calendar. The hymn itself, though exceedingly rude, is to my mind of a very sweet simplicity. Let every faithful heart rejoice, and render thanks to God on high, and with each power of soul and voice extol his praises worthily. Into this dark world Jesus came, and all men might his form behold, while to the limits of the same he passed, that we might be consoled. To all he showed that gentle face, on good and bad alike it shone, its perfect loveliness and grace, the Lord of all concealed from none. O love of Christ beyond all love, O clemency beyond all thought, O grace, all praise of men above, whereby such gifts to men are brought. O blessed face, whose praise we sing, here in the way we worship thee, that in the country of our King, Filled with thy glory we may be. To God on high be glory meet, Equal to thee, eternal Son, Equal to thee, blessed Paraclete, While never-ending ages run. End of section 38。section 39 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal Gloriosa Salvatores, 15th Century A German hymn on the festival of the holy name of Jesus. All that can be said of its date is that it is clearly posterior to the Pane Lingua of St. Thomas, which it imitates. To the name that brings salvation, honor, worship, laud we pay, that for many a generation, hid in God's foreknowledge, lay, but to every tongue and nation, holy church proclaims today, name of gladness, name of pleasure, by the tongue ineffable, name of sweetness passing measure, to the ear delectable, tis our safeguard and our treasure, tis our help against sin and hell, tis the name for adoration. Tis the name of victory, tis the name for meditation in the vale of misery, tis the name for veneration by the citizens on high. Tis the name that whoso preaches finds it music in his ear, tis the name that whoso teaches finds more sweet than honey's cheer. Who its perfect wisdom reaches makes his ghostly vision clear, tis the name by right exalted over every other name. That when we are sore assaulted, puts our enemies to shame, strength to them that else had halted, eyes to blind and feet to lame. Jesu, we thy name adoring, long to see thee as thou art, of thy clemency imploring, so to write it in our heart, that hereafter, upward soaring, we with angels may have part. End of section 39. Section 40 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. O Beata Beatorum. This very elegant sequence is of German origin. Its rhymes are irregular in the original, as here. Blessed feasts of blessed martyrs, saintly days of saintly men, with affections recollections greet we your return again. Worthy are they, worthy wonders to perform the conflict o'er. We with meetest praise and sweetest venerate them evermore. Faith unblenching, hope unquenching, dear loved Lord and simple heart, thus they glorious and victorious o'er the martyrs' happy part. Carceration, true sedation, many a torment fierce and long, flame and axe and laceration, tried and glorified the throng. While they pass through divers tortures, 
till they sank by death oppressed, earth's rejected were elected to have portion with the blessed. By contempt of worldly pleasures, and by mighty battles done, have they merited with angels to be knit for I and one. Wherefore, made co-heirs of glory, ye that sit with Christ on high, join to ours your supplications, as for grace and peace we cry, that this naughty life completed, and its transient labors past, we may merit to be seated in our Lord's bright home at last. End of section 40section forty one of medieval hymns and sequences this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org medieval hymns and sequences by john mason neal tandem fluctus tandem luctus this elegant little advent hymn can scarcely be earlier than the sixteenth century storm and terror Grief and error comes the sun to chase away, and the morning fast adorning all the sky proclaims the day. O true splendor, bright and tender, sun of righteousness on high, port thou showest, source thou owest to the virgin's purity. Now thou keepest rest and sleepest in that zodiac of delight, joy hereafter shall with laughter hail the coming monarch's sight. Satan, gnashing, sees it flashing through that cloud so pure and white, thou endurest ever purest, virgin mother of the light. Darkness scattered, hell gates shattered, victory to them draws nigh, whom profession of transgression justly had condemned to die. Earth rejoices, heavenly voices render praise to God above, now renewing and bedewing every soul with fuller love. End of section 41 Section 42 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal Atole Paulum Lumina 15th or 16th century. The following hymns are clearly of the very latest date, certainly not earlier than the 16th. It may be the beginning of the 17th century. Their intensely subjective character would be a sufficient proof of this, and the rhythm equally shows it. Double rhyme in all medieval hymns is reserved for trochaic measures. Its use as here in iambics gives a certain impression of irreverence which is hard to get over. Notwithstanding the wide difference between these and medieval hymns, they possess, I think, considerable beauty, and perhaps will be more easily appreciated by modern readers. Raise, raise thine eyes a little way, O sinful man, discerning. Thy sins, how great and foul are they, and to repentance turning. On the crucified one look, thou shalt read, as in a book, what well is worth thy learning. Look on the head with such a crown of bitter thorns around it. Look on the blood that trickles down, the feet and hands thus wounded. Let that frame thy tears engage, marking how Judaeus rage and malice hath abounded. But though upon him many a smart its bitterness is spending, yet more, oh, how much more, his heart man's thanklessness is rending. On the cross bewailed by none, mark, O oh man, how Mary's son his life of love is ending. None ever bore such grief before, none ever such affliction as when Judea brought to pass his bitter crucifixion. He that we might dwell on high, bear the pangs that made him die an oft-renewed infliction. O oh, therefore Satan's wiles repel, and yield not to temptation. Think on the woes that Christ befell in working thy salvation. For if he had never died, what could thee and all betide but uttermost damnation? If thus he bled, that only son the father held so dearly, thou wicked servant, faithless one, oh, how much more severely! If the green wood kindled, how shall not every sapless bough consume as fuel merely? O mortal, heed these terrors well, O sinner, flee from sinning, 
consider thou the woes of hell ne'er ending still beginning render thanks to christ on high thus with him beyond the sky eternal glory winning end of section forty two Section number 43 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Excite Sion Filet, fifteenth or sixteenth century. Footnote There is another but inferior hymn with the same commencement. The reference, it need hardly be said, is to Canticles three eleven. End footnote Daughters of Sion see your king go forth go forth to meet him your solomon is hastening where that dear flock shall greet him the scepter and the crown by right he wears in robe of purple dight your solomon the prince of peace bears not his mother's laurel but with the olive bids to cease the long and bloody quarrel. Jesus, the Son of God Most High, offers his peace to them that die. It glitters fair, his diadem, but thorns are there entwining. And from the Red Sea comes each gem that in its wreath is shining. Their radiance glows like stars at night. With precious blood drops are they bright. The royal scepter that he bears, Beneath whom nature quaketh. No monarch's pride and prompt declares. A reed it feebly shaketh. For iron scepter ne'er possessed. The power to guide a human breast. The festive purple of the Lord Is here no garment stately. A vest by very slaves aboard, The worm hath tinged it lately. I am a worm of old, said he, And what its toils have tinged, ye see. Footnote this very, perhaps too, bold metaphor is not, so far as I am aware, employed elsewhere in the whole circle of medieval poetry. In the Compline Hymn for Whit Sunday, in the Serum Breviary, among other titles of our Lord, we find Agnes Ovis Victulus Serpens, Aries, Leo, Vermis, and footnote. We therefore to the King of Kings bow lowly from him learning the pomp and pride that this world brings to make our boast in spurning. Such love the members best adorns for whom the head was crowned with thorns. End of section 43. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 44 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Huck ad Jugum 
Calvary, 15th or 16th century. A poem of the same character and probably of the same date as the last. I know it only from Daniel's Hymology, Volume 2, Page 353. Up to the hill of Calvary, with Christ our Lord ascending, we deem the cross our victory, neath which his steps are bending. What soldier is of generous strain, one honor let him cherish. With Christ upon that battle plain, a thousand times to perish. On must the faithful warrior go, where so the chief proceedeth. And all true hearts will seek the foe, where the banner leadeth. Our highest victory, it is loss. No cup hath such completeness of gall, but that remembered cross will turn it into sweetness. Doth sickness hover o'er thy head? In weakness art thou lying? Behold upon the cross's bed thy sick physician dying. No member in the holy frame that there for thee must languish. But what thy pride hath clothed with shame, but what thy sin with anguish. Have wealth and honor spread their wing, and left thee all unfriended? See naked on the cross thy king, and thy regrets are ended. The fox hath where to lay his head. Her nest receives the sparrow. Thy monarch for his latest bed. One plank hath hard and narrow. Thy good name suffers from the tongue of tyrants and oppressors. Jesus, as on the cross he hung, was reckoned with transgressors. More than the nails and than the spear, his sacred limbs assailing. Judea's children pierced his ear with blasphemy and railing. Fearest thou the death that comes to all and knows no interceder? O glorious struggle, thou wilt fall, the soldier by the leader. Christ went with death to grapple first, and vanquished him before thee. His darts then let him do his worst, can win no triumph o'er thee. And if thy conscience brands each sense, with many a past defilement, here by the fruits of penance, hope thou for reconcilement. For he who bowed his holy head in death serenely sleeping hath grace on contrite hearts to shed and pardon for the weeping. End of section 44 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 45 of Medieval Hymns and Sequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal. Triumph, Plaudent Maria, 15th or 16th century. Sing victory, O ye seas and lands. Ye floods and rivers, clap your hands. Break forth in joy, angelic bands. Crown ye the king that midst you stands, to whom the heavenly gate expands. Bow before his name eternal, things celestial, 
things terrestrial and infernal. Sing victory, angel guards that wait. Lift up, lift up the eternal gate, and let the king come in with state. And as ye meet him on the way, the mighty triumph greet and say, Hail, Yezu, glorious prince, today, bow before his name eternal, things celestial, things terrestrial, and infernal. Who is the king of glory blessed, effulgent in his purple vest? With garments dyed in Bashra, he ascends in pomp and jubilee. It is the king renowned in fight, whose hands have shattered Satan's might. Bow before his name eternal, things celestial, things terrestrial, and infernal. Right gloriously strife endeth now. Henceforward all things to thee bow. And on the Father's side sit thou, O Jesu, all our wishes goal. Be thou our joy when troubles roll, and the reward of every soul. Bow before his name eternal, things celestial, things terrestrial, and infernal. End of section 45. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. End of Medieval Hymns and Sequences by John Mason Neal.